this time. Here we go. Welcome. Uh, today's Wednesday, the 27th. Welcome uh, to our Ways and Means Committee hearing today. Appreciate having you all join us as we uh, venture into these uh, Zoom hearings once again. Um, I want to mention to everyone who's uh, watching or about to join us, uh, when you're in the waiting room, make sure your name matches the name you signed up with or we can't uh, let you in. And also, uh, we will, after a, a given bill hearing, uh, if you've testified, we'll um, please leave or uh, you'll be removed, but you are welcome back in, of course, when you have your next bill hearing. And everyone can watch our hearings live on the YouTube station or even immediately after the hearing's over, watch it rerun, um, if anyone had that question. Uh, today, we have 12 education bills. Uh, we're gonna start with uh, Delegate Wilson with uh, House Bill 11. And uh, one moment, Delegate Wilson, I do wanna mention in case anyone was interested in House Bill 417 that was withdrawn. Uh, that should be noted on the website, but in case anyone came here today to watch or testify on that bill to let you know that that's not happening. Uh, so again, Delegate Wilson, House Bill 11, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Colleagues, uh, I'm here today to uh, introduce House Bill number 11, which is basically public schools, African-American history, the development of content and standards and implementation. Um, this all started because um, my 13-year-old daughter had come to me um, some time ago during the interim, and she, uh, weirdly enough, was talking about uh, Black history. We've discussed the Tulsa bombings uh, very recently, and one of the things she said was, uh, Dad, you know, um, we learned so much about the Holocaust in, uh, in a country that we were never in as, as uh, Americans, and we learned very little about the Black struggle. You know, they basically, uh, she said, because she even hears at her age that, well, it's been 40 generations. What's wrong? What's taking you guys so long? And her argument was that maybe if people learned a little bit more about African-Americans, not just their contributions, but truly what we went through um, in this country, that maybe there'd be a little more apathy. And when we discussed this, I realized that her history books haven't changed from my childhood. Columbus still discovered America. Lincoln still freed the slaves. Even with the advent of the internet, we haven't adapted. And um, that forced me to kind of, you know, as a parent, kind of look to, you know, to myself and I did a little research and I discovered the 1619 Project, which is basically, hopefully some of y'all have heard of it, but it's basically a way to uh, demonstrate uh, African-American history beginning with the enslavement and how they contribute to the founding of this nation. Refine and it reframes the way that we understand our history, that legacy of slavery and the unparalleled role that African-Americans and black people have played in this democracy. I looked through obviously schools like Chicago, DC, Buffalo, New York, they're starting to implement this program because there's no nationwide guideline if you exclude the 1776 project, which I recommend that we all do, um, which basically sets the standards for uh, teaching social studies. It's also, and it's obviously left up to the individual states and districts. I'm fine with that. However, I think it's very important. We have roughly 894,000 students in our public schools. 34% of those are African-American. Um, to this day, we're still grouped up with this marginalized group of individuals and even do a review of the, um, uh, um, the way that this is laid out for our teaching. It's fairly, I don't, I don't wanna go through all the details, but it's fairly minimal the way it's laid out. I emailed a timeline because I am horrible with technology and could not find a way to upload it. So I emailed it to all of your accounts, which basically just lays out things that should be addressed throughout our history. And remember, I'm not a subject matter expert. I know uh, the good delegate, um, maybe some of these guys are teachers and they know a lot more. I'm not telling people how to teach. I'm not saying this all needs to be teached in one class. I'm saying this is something we as a nation, as a country and as a state need to move more towards because by that timeline, you can see there's a vast amount of participation in American history, African-American history as well. And most of, it, most of us, we have to learn it on our own. And it's about time that we learn it as a state instead of having something that we glaze over. I think that our kids get a sterilized kind of broad view of the contributions of African-Americans and their ancestors. And we don't really hear about the suffering, the struggle. And I put some examples in there like the Black Wall Street Nobody even knew that existed, or the fact that it was firebombed and burnt down. The same thing with the, you know, with uh, Rosewood. The same thing with the multitude of issues that African Americans had to with, withstand. Because at the end of the day, 
my daughter's view on um, African American history is slavery, Lincoln, maybe a little Harriet Tubman thrown in there, and then we get off to um, Martin Luther King. They don't really talk about what happened and what her grandfather dealt with watching these Confederate statues be put up in the 50s, watching what happened in the 1920s, how African-Americans who even tried through segregated areas to be successful were stopped, marginalized, and pushed out of their own areas. In conclusions, I think that Maryland school districts, while they do mention African-American history, it is very brief. And again, if you look at the timeline I provided, and please, you guys know me, I'm not a genius, there is already a curriculum made out for this. This is not something I created, nor would I dare to create it because I'm not an education uh, major. But I do notice that Montgomery County has already started revamping some of their, um, their at least their eighth grade uh, U.S. history curriculum and actually includes something called stolen labor, which basically shows these children part of how our country was developed, designed, and it was on the backs of these people. I'm asking that you guys please take a look at my timeline at the information if you want to review yourself because again I know you're the subject matter experts but I do urge a favor before it on House Bill 11. I do think it's worthwhile and it's time to expose our kids black white and everyone else of the struggles of the African Americans in building this country. Thank you. Uh, thank you Delegate Wilson. Uh, Delegate Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you, um, Delegate Wilson, for bringing this um, bill. I do want to um, acknowledge that today is the International Holocaust Remembrance Day, and I'm proud that I do know that, but I do believe people should know more fully about all the um, different people that make up our great nation, and um, I want to commend you for bringing this bill. Um, one of the things I wanted to um, hear from you is... Um, You've been muted somehow, Delegate Smith. I didn't do oh, I maybe accidentally touched the space bar. I apologize for that. I wanted to know, um, Delegate Wilson, um, what you think um, could be um, done to really integrate the understanding that Black history is American history. I, um, it's not really like separate. And um, so just recently I watched um, Finding Your Roots on PBS, you know, with um, Dr. Gates. And he was speaking to a very well-known Marylander. He was talking, um, to, oh uh, my goodness, the director, John Waters. And all his family history was Carroll County, Montgomery County, it was a Maryland story. And there were some disturbing elements of his family story where he found out that some of his family that were slaveholders had actually gone so far as to, um, um, you know, find a woman that had been assisted to her freedom. Um, she was assisted by three black freemen. Maryland had one of the highest populations of free people at the time. And then he discovered that the penalty for helping her gain her freedom was that they were enslaved, free black men. And I remember him saying, this was just last week, I didn't know that you could be free and brought back into slavery. So this is someone who I believe is, you know, a knowledgeable person, an exposed person, but it just was a, a snapshot of the collective mass ignorance many people have about the conditions of slavery and what that means to the American story. So I just wanted to know more about how you feel people who are not black benefit from this information. Well, and again, because, uh, you know, knowing our brothers and sisters of all colors out there are interested in the truth. I believe that like, you know, the whole uh, proclamation of 1863 that a lot of people really thought that that's what freed the slaves, but it wasn't until June 19th of 1865 that they, they actually brought that down to Texas, i.e. Juneteenth. You know, I believe people want to know they've just never been exposed, which is why I brought this bill up because, I, you know, I've gotten a few letters about how that I'm trying to drive a wedge between African-Americans and white people. I, I don't think that white people don't want to know about African-American history. I don't think I've, I literally have gotten quite, now I remember guys, I'm Southern Maryland and uh, the good delegate uh, from Charles County and myself, you know, she was the first African-American ever to hold office in the history of, of Charles County. I'm the first African-American ever hold state office in the history of Southern Maryland. It's still, you know, we still got some uh, bridges to cross here, but I don't think that people don't want to know. They just haven't had a chance to be exposed. I've yet to meet a white person that wasn't interested in knowing the truth. And I think it's very important that we arm our children with the truth. Um, I thought that the cost would be a little higher. I'm blessed that the, uh, the note wasn't that high. I know there's a lot of work to be done on it, but that's why I sent you guys the timeline and, and have you refer to the 1619 project. This is already a thing. There's already curriculums developed. I would just like to see them incorporated into our uh, community in our state. Thank you, Delegate. Thank you, Delegate. Delegate Lutke?
Sorry, hitting the wrong button. Uh, Delegate, thanks, thanks for the bill. I'm, I'm uh, surprised that you got letters and you know, teaching the truth was trying to drive a wedge. That's that's frustrating. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, it's something. You know, I was a social studies teacher, and this is a conversation that is is long overdue and and has been starting to happen and should continue to happen. But a couple of years ago, I went to the library at the University of Maryland, uh, and for one of my classes to demonstrate. Uh, the importance of teaching history uh, that's actually valid, um, found a textbook that suggested that uh, slavery was good for African-Americans and that they benefited from it. Um, and that was a textbook that was used in Maryland schools as recently as the 1960s. Um, so I appreciate this bill. Now, uh, you know, we often as a legislature don't dictate the, the details of curriculum. Um, and so my question is, you know, would you, be comfortable if rather than sort of detailing the uh, dictating the details of curriculum, um, we were to try to create ongoing um, an opportunity for folks to, to on a regular basis be reevaluating state curriculum for African American history, uh, kind of like we do with the, the Financial Literacy and Capabilities Commission. And um, uh, I don't, sorry, a delegate, I don't want to <laughs> call you by first name. Um, you, you know my personality. I, I'm, I'm doing. You know my personality. I'm all about you know, let's 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 tear it down and build again. We'll watch everything burn. I know that that my personality isn't always the right way to address mm -hmm. policy. I, I personally worry when you give people too many. I don't want to say options, but number one, I would like students from all over the state to kind of be learning some of the same stuff. Mm -hmm. What I don't want to happen is individuals in. Charles County to be learned something different from Montgomery County because then we have a bunch of ignorant students. So yeah. I do. So if there's a way to do it again, I understand the importance of you being a teacher of, um, of, you know, each district having their own say so, but certain things are very important. The fact that we've been robbed of our history for this many years, I'm mm -hmm. very nervous because remember two years ago, we were being taught that same nonsense. So I'm always nervous that it's not going to be done right or won't be done with good faith or we'll do the bare minimums. So uh, yeah, right. I, I will definitely defer to you guys on how to implement this. I just, yeah, I, I'm always nervous about giving options sometimes. No, I agree and appreciate that. And absolutely, this should be in state content standards and taught in every school system across the state. You're absolutely 100% right on that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Delegate Guyton. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you very much, Delegate Wilson, for bringing this bill. Um, my question sort of technical, piggybacking a little bit on Delegate Lukey, Lukey's bill when we talk about options. Um, certainly, there are ways to make sure that the bill as written is actually integrated into local jurisdictions and curriculum in a way I think that you would be comfortable with. But um, my question is actually a little bit different. In your bill, you specifically uh, say that while the state board shall develop guidelines and curriculum, they may pass regulations to implement them. So I wondered if you meant for the bill to read that way or whether you would like to strengthen the bill. I personally would like to strengthen the bill. Thank you for the question. I was trying to soft pedal because honestly, and I, I know you guys are subject matter experts, but you really are to me. So whatever you guys need to do to the bill, I'm fine with, I just tried it because a lot of times I come in stomping my feet saying, I want it, I want it now. And if you don't give it to me, you're my enemy. I was trying a different approach. So of course I would like to strengthen the bill if possible. Well, and I guess if you don't mind me following up, Madam Chair, uh, is so as it's written, they could go through this process of developing the curriculum, but there's nothing in this bill that says it has to be implemented. Right, I would rather, I would rather. Is there a specific reason or other than you were just trying to be nice and let us, Nobody approached you and asked you to write it that way. No, I'm just trying to be a nice guy today. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate the bill. Um, and I think that's a great point. Thank you. Uh, Delegate Patterson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, my, my colleague from Charles County for this bill. Uh, I certainly uh, echo what you said in terms of the need for it. Um, my question has to do with um, best practices in terms of the topics you've cited, is there leverage? Are you willing to include um, some examples from counties that have implemented or in the stages of implementing the curriculum? And I would suggest that it would be a requirement. Um, 
obviously I, I would love the requirement aspect. I would love okay. more styles instead of maze. And um, again, the reason I, I referred to the 1619 project was because I didn't want to step on Delegate Lukey's and your toes as subject matter experts to say how I thought this should be taught. Because I, I really, that is just not what I'm good at. I'm good at stepping on toes, but I'm not good at teaching. So again, however you guys choose to do that, if whatever architect you want to lay out or you know, right. put in place, I'm more than happy to go with it. This is just a, you know, a policy thing I think needs to happen. However we can make it happen, if it takes time, I get it. But you know, I, the sooner than later, in the shower before the May, Absolutely. I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're muted, Madam Chair. Del Delegate Washington. Thank you, Alistair. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the question is just, um, is this Bill Crossfeld in the Senate? You know, I'm trying to be better, but I'm not. So no. <laughs> Look, I'm not a big fan of Crossfells either. So I, I just, I just, I just wondered because you know I, I, I too think it's uh, worthwhile uh, for us to um, you know explore what we can do on this. Um, but I think that you know getting over to the Senate is the issue, right? Um, the crossfall would have been great. And in hindsight, I'm trying guys, it's just, it's taken up, it's a process for me. So maybe next time, but hopefully we can get this through on this time and we'll, you know, pull some magic on the other side as well. No promises, but it looks like a great bill. I'll say that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Delegate Lutke, did you have another question? I did not. I just keep forgetting to lower my hand. Okay, uh, thank you, Delegate Wilson. We do, do have two people testifying uh, for the first one in favor. We have Finley Slenker. Finley, thanks for joining us today. Oh, we can't hear you. You're not muted, but for some reason we can't hear you. Try again. No, unfortunately. Um, okay. Oh, yes, go ahead. No. No, now we, we don't again. Okay, we're going to come back to you after the person who opposes the bill. So if you could try to work on it while... Okay. Oh, wait, no, I fixed it. <laughs> Excellent. I'm so sorry. All right, go ahead. Thanks for coming today. Thank you for having me. Um, yes, I am here uh, in support being a student, um, I go to Annapolis Middle School here in Annapolis and I'm in eighth grade and for my entire elementary school and middle school career, we've learned exactly what Delegate Wilson was talking about, about the Underground Railroad, uh, Martin Luther King, Abraham Lincoln, Harriet Tubman, all of these big events that happened in the in our history in the in u.s history but it's only so much information that they give on these topics a lot of the things that we i learned in school are about how harriet tubman helped escaping slaves find safe houses during the underground railroad um and how abraham lincoln abolished slavery how Martin Luther King Jr. abolished segregation. And a lot of that is true. Like it is definitely true. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the things that were taught were like Delegate Wilson said, were glazed over. And a lot of the things that kids should be learning are more in depth, more learning about the struggles and the hardships that African-Americans faced in US history. And not just the in during these events, but during like the 70s, the 60s, all throughout the 20th century, there's so much history that hasn't been taught that kids don't know about. Um, there's, and there's definitely things that we could learn more on how I've done research on Harriet Tubman. She was actually the first woman to lead a major military operation. Her and 150 African-American soldiers rescued more than 700 slaves in the Kambahi Ferry Raid during the Civil War. But a lot of the things that I researched that I know now only came from that research. And it's 
important to note that these things that I'm talking about are things that I didn't learn in school and that I more learned online. And a lot of the things that kids do know about black history and about the history that they aren't learning in school is from social media. They're on the popular app TikTok that I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. A lot of the things that people learn are coming from those types of apps and online and where they should be learning them in school because social media isn't always correct. Social media is filled of truth, but it's also filled of myths. There's a myth that uh, has been debated for years and years and years about people saying that um, people used quilt patterns during the Underground Railroad as maps for escaping slaves. It's never been proven, but it's still talked about online and no one knows if it's real or not. They can see a video and believe it, but they'll never really know if it's true unless they're learning it from people they trust, like school. And a lot of the things and one of the reasons why we need to include more of this history is like Delegate Wilson said, a lot of the things that you're learning in school influence the way you grow up. So if you're growing up learning about how great our country is and how peaceful and there's only these certain wars and these wars that we won and we triumphed through is true, but not fully you grow up learning about how great a country is and you grow up in the eye of ignorance, not knowing about the real, like, I, want, I don't wanna say dirty truth, but it's kind of true. It's growing up learning about how great George Washington was and all of our founding fathers, when in reality, they all said all men are created equal yet had hundreds of slaves that worked for them till the day they died. And it's important to note that being like learning these things can make such a big impact on the world and upcoming children that will grow up. And knowing these important things will help them in the future to make the next step to not, on, not just seeing someone as, oh, I should probably do I should probably think and be more considerate because of the history, but more I understand them, but we should talk to them as equals and not I understand that you had faced that tragedy. All right, thank you, Miss Lanker. Um, any questions for Miss Lanker? Thank you for joining us today. We always love to have students here at our committee. Really appreciate your contributions. Uh, next, we have Vince McAvoy signed up. Thank you, committee. I apologize for just half the screen there. Um, I want to say that um, hearing Delegates Patterson and uh, uh, Delegate Lukey chime in on this from an educational standpoint, I leave a lot of my concerns, which were largely with spirit and tone. Um, I, I am concerned about the divisiveness issue. Uh, why was Rosewood uh, not picked? Friedman's Town, for instance. Uh, <clears throat> there's nothing about the black churches. You know, we think, I heard a statistic that in Baltimore, uh, where I'm from, we have more churches per square mile than any place else. I, I don't have that confirmed, but I think that's a very integral piece. So, um, and I have just heard mention of the Underground Railroad, that being included. Of course, we have tours in Maryland where we actually can catch Maryland's historic asylum. So um, hearing that change in spirit and tone uh, removes my, my opposition to this. I think that um, one of the things that uh, Delegate Wilson brought up, of course, uh, is our firsts, right? And we have 30% of the population black in this state. We have 40% representation in the legislature, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, these, these kind of things are positive things that we should be confident. I think that should be included. I think it's relevant. Uh, you go to um, uh, my uh, comrade in the Senate, uh, Senator Carter, uh, her dad, of course, is part of Black history here in Maryland. And I would like to see it localized. In other words, maybe it's also divided. 
we have a lot of great firsts in this state. And I just, when I'm hearing you all talk about this in a different spirit and tone, I'm greatly relieved. And, and I guess for that reason, I probably would, would uh, put my opposition to the bill. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. McAvoy. And, and I'm, I'm glad you were able to be here today to hear about the, uh, the, the, the spirit of this bill and its intent. So um, um, I don't know if there's any questions since he's essentially removed his opposition. Um, so uh, I'd like to thank Delegate Wilson, uh, Ms. Lenker, and uh, Mr. McAvoy uh, for joining us today. And we're going to move on to the next bill. Um, la last I knew everyone, um, I don't believe Delegate Acevedo is here yet because they're having a vote in appropriations right now. Uh, if that's not the case, he should jump in. So we're going to skip House Bill 140 for the moment. I believe Delegate Riley is waiting and she has uh, the bill after that and that's House Bill 54. Welcome back, Delegate Riley. Thank you, Madam Chair, good to be back. Okay, um, good afternoon, Chair Kaiser and the Ways and Means Com Committee. For the record, I am Teresa Riley, Harford County Delegation Chair here to introduce House Bill 54, Education, Harford County Liability of School Bus Contractors, both Harford County owned bus school buses and contractor owned school buses are insured by the Maryland Association of Boards of Education at $1 million. Several years ago, that coverage was reduced by the school board from 2 million to 1 million in coverage. Currently under, currently under that policy, the county owned owned buses and the contractor owned buses are not treated equally. County owned buses have a liability cap of 400,000 and the school board cannot be held liable for beyond that amount per Maryland statute. However, the private contractors do not have the benefit of this cap, which jeopardizes their livelihoods with the risk of a judgment in excess of 1 million. For that reason, many of them have unsuccessfully tried to purchase an additional contractor umbrella policy. However, no insurance company will provide secondary insurance coverage in addition to existing underlying coverage that is self-insured. Um, uh, one second. Our school bus contractors play an important role for Harford County and the Harford County public school system by facilitating needed transportation for their students. These contractors are from family owned farms living within the communities they serve, which saves on travel times for our students and expenses that the county does not have to bear. There is no reason to disadvantage private bus contractors with liability in excess of those county owned buses when all the buses serve in the same functions and are subject to the same safety standards. With the passage of HB 54, our bus contractors will be fairly treated. They may not be held liable beyond the limits of the entity's insurance coverage, which is currently at the $1 million. I respectfully ask for a favorable vote on HB 54, which is a Harford County delegation bill. This bill has also been cross-filed by our Harford County Senators in the way of SB 159. And I would be happy to take any questions at this time. Any Thank questions? you. Sorry about that. Any questions, okay. Delegate Riley? Uh, all right, uh, seeing no questions, we have, um, Coming here from the Maryland School Bus Contractors Association. We'll start with Steve Nelson. Mr. Nelson, are you here? Yes, just got <clears throat> just got my mic on. Um, good afternoon, uh, Chairman and, and the committee members. I well, appreciate you listening to this bill and, and uh, giving me a chance to talk about it. I've been in the school bus business in Hartford County for 41 years. Um, several years ago, the county did cover have a $2 million uh, liability insurance for us. Several years ago, they reduced that to a million. Um, at that time, we 
kept requesting that it be put back to the $2 million, um, and they would not do it. Uh, they said they never had a claim that high, so it was money unspent. Um, they said we could try to get our own coverage. Uh, several contractors have went to different uh, insurance carriers, myself included. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, we are unable to get insurance on top of their um, their insurance because of them being self-insured. No uh, private insurance company will write an umbrella on on self-insurance. Um, so that's where we're at. That's the reason we got we we run the buses in Hartford County. We may do a field trip and go on a field trip or even school from school to school and be following or in front of a county bus that is capped at 400,000, which just a few years ago, uh, it was only a hundred thousand dollar cap that they had in 2016. Um, they increased it from a hundred to 400 and we're still at a, at a million dollars with not being able to, to get anything over and above that. And it's just trying to give us some peace of mind to where we won't lose what we've worked for and um, our business or our, our home and our farms and, and whatever thing we may have. Um, it just gives us some peace of mind and it doesn't cost anybody anything. It's just uh, kind of making us not equal, but equal as far as the uh, uh, liability we go. Thank you, any questions for me? Uh, I'm gonna wait until uh, all three uh, speak who are in favor and then we'll uh, uh, offer some questions. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Uh, Stephen Davis? Are you here today, Mr. Davis? Uh, and then uh, next we have uh, Aaron Appel. Yeah, and I apologize. My um, unfortunately, virtual learning has me logged in as my son, so I apologize that his name and not mine is appearing. <laughs> but I, I will work on fixing that. <laughs> the uh, trials of virtual learning. Uh, at any rate, good afternoon. Aaron Appel here, representing the statewide association of school bus contractors in support of House Bill 54, and also to provide some background. I'd like to first start by saying that the full Senate passed this identical bill unanimously last year, but it never received a hearing here due to COVID. By way of background, Maryland is fairly unique in terms of the hybrid system of private and publicly owned buses used to transport students throughout the state. Only a handful of other states employ a similar system. Most of those that do contract with large national bus contractors, not the family, small family owned businesses that exist in Maryland and make it so unique. Only four school systems in Maryland own their entire fleets of school buses. The rest contract out all or in part. In Harford County, there are 330 contractor owned buses owned by 31 separate contractors and around 100 county owned buses. The county owned buses are those used to transport special needs students. Um, the, uh, some of them, some of the contractors own one or two buses, others own larger fleets, but under each contract, the, the county board provides them with $1 million in liability insurance coverage through MABE, the Maryland Association of Boards of Education. And as Delegate Riley mentioned, it used to be 2 million, uh, but the board felt this level of coverage was unnecessary. And so they reduced it a handful of years ago. Since that time, Harford County has gone to the school system, the contractors have gone to the school system repeatedly to ask them to reinstate the $2 million coverage. They've met with MAVE on several occasions. They've sought out their own separate additional coverage, but have been repeatedly denied because no one will provide secondary coverage on top of, um, on top of a self-insured group pool, which MAVE is. So they're stuck in a situation in which they feel they need additional coverage, but they are literally unable to obtain it. They brought this issue to their county delegation and the bill you see before you today is the result. A few more things just quickly to underscore in conclusion. All county owned school buses are insured through MAVE at $400,000 and they're capped at that limit per state law. And uh, additionally, the state of Maryland requires 1.5 million coverage for all contractors that run uh, school 
excuse me, uh, charter trips for students such as summer camps, et cetera, beyond just to, to and from school. Um, so we're, it's our hope that you'll assist these small family owned businesses to protect what they have literally spent their lifetimes building. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. Um, uh, any questions for the, uh, for the proponents? Uh, excuse me real quick. Um, Stephen Davis, he's, this is Steve Nelson, I'm sorry. Uh, Stephen Davis is waiting in the waiting room. He hasn't gotten ah. in somehow or another. He just okay. texted Thank you. It's uh, good to know that. I um, uh, I do not, in fact, see the name Stephen Davis up. So if he wants to fix his name, if he's noted somewhere else, and we'll we'll go to the opponent uh, first, if because uh, there there is no one by that name in the waiting room. Uh, Mr. George Tall, unfavorable. Uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee. Uh, my name is George Tolley. I'm legislative chair for the Maryland Association for Justice. And I'm here to speak in opposition to this bill, and I appreciate very much the opportunity to do so. Um, this is a, a, a bill. Uh, what the bill does is create immunity for private school bus contractors over and above the amount of insurance that they have what you heard in the testimony, and this is also the same as the testimony over on the Senate side, that's not what they've been asking for. They didn't ask for immunity. They asked for more insurance coverage, and that's what they should get. Um, they used to get $2 million in coverage. Uh, thinking about what they do for a living, transporting school children to and from on the roadways, uh, they should have more than a million dollars in coverage. But the reason they don't is the MAIB has apparently arbitrarily and without explanation reduced the amount of coverage available. Uh, and I don't know why this body couldn't require MAIB to offer more. And that would solve their problem and ensure that children have adequate access and their families to insurance, to pay medical bills and long-term rehabilitation costs and things that would be associated with a catastrophic school bus accident. <laughs> so, so the you know the the they went to their county delegation and this is what they got is it well we'll give you immunity at potentially four hundred thousand dollars per school bus full of children. Um, the families of those children would have to make up the difference the, between the million and the 400,000 or the 2 million and the 400,000 that would all go to the families who would find themselves having to pay for emergency room care, find themselves having to pay for long-term therapies and, and long-term care. Uh, and, and that makes no sense to us when the people that you're trying to help with this bill want to be able to buy more insurance and there's a capacity to get to make that happen, granting immunity is the wrong idea, and because of that, we oppose the bill. Um, we don't think immunity is appropriate in this cir circumstance, and 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 we ask for an unfavorable report, or or you know maybe an amendment or a work group or something. But that's not what the bill asks for. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. We do have a question for you, Mr. Tolly, uh, Delegate Lasanti. Yeah, sure. And I, and I guess it could be for uh, Mr. Talley or, or anybody because we had an extensive conversation in our delegation because there, there are really two issues here. There's the one that's our constituent issue um, in our county who, um, who, who are struggling to, uh, to meet the necessary uh, liability coverage and have been denied that opportunity. So that's what this bill is about. So that, that's the one piece of that. But Mr. Talley, you bring up that other issue and maybe, and there's nobody here, I don't believe from Mabe, but I'm very curious as to why they would be treating private contractors differently than public contractors, because they are still, <laughs> the, the, the exposure is still, is identical. Yep. Yes, so is. I, I don't understand why as a state we would be allowing that to happen. Uh, so, and that's a great question, uh, Delegate Lasanti, and thank you very much. And, and I'm, I'm not, and I hope in my testimony, I don't come across as, uh, unsympathetic to the plight of Mr. Nelson and his uh, uh, contractors. It, they want more insurance and they want it for all the right reasons. This bill doesn't give it to them. Um, as for the way that, that Maryland law treats 
public school buses and says it's okay for those public school buses to have limits of liability of four hundred thousand uh, dollars, and it used to be one hundred. It really was incredibly low, and th that bill went through the Judiciary Committee and and JPR, and they um, increased off it to increase it to four hundred. Mako opposed it, or, and and Mabe opposed those those increases. Um, we'd like to see them higher. We'd like to see them more realistic because they're frozen in place. Unlike other caps, they don't increase automatically. Uh, so it's 400,000 now, 400,000 forever until somebody gets around to, to fixing the number. And it is inadequate. I mean, if, if what the school bus contractors are telling you is they want 2 million in coverage to feel safe, 400,000 is 20% of that. So it is very low and it's wrong but this bill doesn't address that, that maybe we could have another bill. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, seeing no other questions, we will go back to Mr. Davis who has uh, the Zoom. Mr. Davis, welcome, you have three minutes. Hi, thank you. Um, sorry, I don't know sure what's going on with the technical problems here, but long story short, five years ago, I tried to get $5 million coverage. We own a 75.5 acre farm in Falston and uh, I just wanted to protect our assets. So I tried to get a $5 million coverage policy from <coughs> Rosenkow and Associates and it was impossible to do. Okay. Hey there. So it was impossible to do. So it led us to the state level and having this meeting with you guys. We just need more insurance. I understand that this has drawn a lot of controversy across the state because of course we, everyone knows that there's not enough insurance for the students. Hey there. So um, basically, we just need to be capped. If we can't get more insurance and buy insurance, we need to cap it. And it's impossible to buy more insurance. So it leads us to this. And uh, really, I'd like to be answer any questions that you have. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Davis. And in terms of the uh, technical difficulties, we can't let people in on the Zoom who don't um, uh, write in their name. And in this case, we still needed your last name. So it uh, we need everyone to make it easy for us to know who we're having for each hearing. Uh, are there any questions for Mr. Davis? All right, uh, seeing none, thank you all very much. Thank uh, all, uh, all, all four of you for testifying today. Uh, and thank you to Delegate Riley. Uh, we're done with the hearing on House Bill 54. Uh, as I mentioned before, we skipped over House Bill 140 while Delegate Acevedo was uh, voting in appropriations, but we're now back to House Bill 140. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and good afternoon uh, to uh, both to uh, the Chair and Vice Chair, as well as members uh, of the Ways and Means Committee. For the record, uh, Delegate Gabriel Aceva representing House Bill 140, the Commission on History, Culture, uh, and Civics in Education. Um, colleagues, I know we all agree that every child, regardless of income or zip code, deserves um, and has the right to quality and equitable education. Uh, ensuring that uh, students of color, LGBTQ plus students uh, and students with disabilities see themselves reflected in school curricula uh, is also a critical piece of learning. Uh, HB 140 seeks to squarely address this phenomenon. Uh, when passed, it would give Maryland students a better understanding of the culture and contributions of all Americans. Uh, requiring that history and culture of American Indians uh, or indigenous people, Asian Americans, uh, African Americans, Latinx, uh, and LGBTQ plus folks be included in civil government lessons, uh, and two, creating a commission that would be staffed with ex experts and scholars in their respective fields uh, to make recommendations on the curricula and then work with state and local boards of education. I'll point out that as researchers Amy Stewart Wells, Lauren Fox, uh, and Diana Cor uh, Cordova Cobo note in their report how racially diverse schools and classroom can benefit all students, uh, support for school integration must go beyond uh, creating uh, schools uh, that are diverse, but also um, a diverse curricula and accountability approaches that allow educators to tap into the multiple educational benefits of diversity. So in fact, the benefits of an inclusive and multicultural curriculum are manifold. 
its benefits are economic in that it prepares our students to boldly and confidently enter diverse workplaces and multicultural environments. Its, beneficials are, its benefits are societal in that it helps those um, uh, to expose them to biases, stereotypes, and policies that can restrict achievement. Uh, an inclusive curriculum helps reinforce our co collective dedication to justice in ensuring that content is fair, accurate, and inclusive while also accommodating for diverse teaching and learning styles of teachers and students alike. So consider further uh, expanding school curricula encourages free thought by fostering an environment where students can understand government at every level, ponder ideas such as civic engagement, how discrimination and prejudice negatively impact democratic society, or how they can become more sensitive and respectful to social differences. Indeed, including a variety of cultural perspectives allows educators to discuss less common or underrepresented views and ideas, but it also provides our students with a more holistic understanding of the subject area and exposes them to the positive role models from a variety of different backgrounds and cultural groups. I point to, you know, not just folks like Dr. King, but Ella Baker, James Baldwin, and um, so many other leaders like Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, uh, and uh, Frida Kahlo and um, so many other LGBTQ plus leaders who have contributed really to the um, social, economic and political fabric that is America. And it's important that when we are providing instruction about the history of America, about government, that we are providing students with really an all um, around an inclusive education. Uh, as the venerable civil rights activist, Marion Wright Edelman once remarked, you can't be what you can't see. So accordingly, colleagues, HB 140 removes from our uh, education system the metaphoric blinders that have for too long limited student achievement and ambition and opens a world of possibilities. I respectfully urge a favorable report on House Bill 140 so that we can truly transform our school systems in addition to the very impactful legislation that uh, we will be looking at um, and no doubt passing such as the blueprint uh, and uh, the Built to Learn Act, all of which are important to providing every child with a quality and equitable education. I'll add lastly that a number of uh, community organization, education advocates, teachers unions, as well as students ad advocacy groups have submitted testimony in support uh, of House Bill 140 to the committee. Um, and again, I urge a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate. Uh, next we have, oh, I'm sorry. Any questions for uh, Delegate Acevedo? All right, uh, seeing none, we'll go to Hamza Ewing. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the House Ways and Means Committee. My name is Hamza Ewing and on behalf of the Council on American Islamic Relations, I thank you for this opportunity to testify on House Bill 140, which is the Commission on History, Culture and Civics and Education. The Council on American Islamic Relations is America's largest Muslim civil rights and advocacy organization. Establishing a commission that examines the history, culture, and civics of our country and state in order to make recommendations to the State Board of Education regarding incorporating programs and standards would help acknowledge the contributions of minority groups who have long been disenfranchised and underrepresented. This bill would help, cap would help capture more balance and factual representation of different communities and help create a healthier society that promotes diversity and inclusivity. We en encourage measures that help the establishment of a more pluralistic society. We thank Delegate Acevedo for his leadership on this bill. And once again, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, uh, incredibly brief testimony, appreciate that. Uh, the next we have is Angisa Achille McKenzie. Sorry if I haven't pronounced your name correctly. Hi, um, I'm Angusa Chile McKenzie. Um, I'm the founder of Southern Marylanders for Racial Equality down here in Charles Calvert and St. Mary. Um, so I am favorable with uh, amendments and my main amendment is that um, I see the need for all of this. I'm a mother, I'm a former teacher. Um, I see the need for it, but I would like this bill to go a step further in that I feel that the teachers need to be re-educated because uh, we have met with youth in our communities who will tell you that racial slurs go unpunished. Um, my own daughter's teacher um, told her that 
the, the fictional Disney princess Tiana uh, was acceptable as a black history subject for an assignment. We have teachers who are not culturally competent. So if we hand them a curriculum, no matter what the commission uh, recommends, if you don't have competent, culturally competent educators who can deliver the material to the students in a way that they can digest and who are not ready to digest it themselves because they um, have these biases or are um, underexposed to different cultures, you're, you're kind of just um, throwing things against the wall to see if they stick. Um, and so one thing I wanted to also point out is that when Virginia, the, the Virginia governor tried to create this black studies uh, commission as well, but they found that the main issue was that they didn't have the teachers trained to implement any of those same things, any of these things that they wanted to do with the curriculum, et cetera. So I feel that this bill would be stronger if there was a component that addressed the, the teacher's lack of cultural competency because the pedagogy is where the rubber meets the road. Um, and that creating a school climate where kids feel comfortable, safe, and are not um, under, uh, I guess what you would call social violence, uh, where bullying um, along racial lines is not dismissed. You know, I, I had so much that I went through just for my name, uh, being a Nigerian American, um, just with teachers being culturally insensitive to that one small thing. And they should know all the wealth of different experiences and cultures that formed our great state of Maryland, as well as our nation. Um, and so there was an ACLU written testimony as well. And I agree with uh, the approaches stated in that written testimony as well. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next, we have LaShawn Stitt. Dr. LaShawn Stitt, welcome. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, as well as um, members of the Ways and Means Committee. I appreciate you allowing me to have this opportunity to speak on behalf of um, Delegate Acevedo's bill, HB 140. Um, I am a doctor, I'm an educator. I've been an educator for the past 23, almost 24 years. So I'm speaking on behalf of um, those fellow educators who are um, conscious and very aware of the lack of cultural relevance and cultural responsibility that many of our teachers in Maryland schools are being faced with. Um, as a parent and a resident of Pikesville, um, Pikesville, Maryland in Baltimore County for the past 11 years, uh, I have been a very observant. I'm a former assistant principal in Baltimore City Schools, so I'm very well connected to the curriculum and the lack of culturally, culturally responsive pedagogy that is existing there. Um, I have two organizations that I'm, I'm actually uh, speaking on behalf of its Women of the World and Educate the World. Both have been founded by me and they're both um, youth empowering organizations that also assist parents, caregivers, community partners in educating and empowering young people in urban school districts as um, particularly middle and high school students. Um, the purpose of my testimony here is basically to express the importance and the significance of a culturally responsive curriculum. I am a professor at CCBC, um, as well as a um, clinical supervisor for teachers who are with Western Governors University seeking teaching certification. And so I'm very well aware that there are many teachers who are inadequately, inadequately trained in the classroom and they're not prepared to address the needs of students in, these, um, in our schools, in Maryland schools. Um, if you notice a, a, an accent, I'm originally from New York, but I've been here for 11 years and I have been involved in various organizations um, that are addressing the, the, um, the need for an anti-racist curriculum in um, Maryland schools. Uh, as I stated before, the teachers are not adequately tra trained and um, there are so many diverse backgrounds in the schools that we have um, an implicit bias that is existent. And my testimony is really to support the need for a curriculum um, that trains teachers to be adequately prepared. Uh, I know that there are many teacher education programs that are missing the mark. Um, so I, I, as a professor, and I see many students who have come through Maryland schools, uh, they are very unaware. And as the term was used earlier, ignorant um, to many of the contributions 
However, the culture and climate of anti-racism is non-existent. So um, therefore, I would suggest that the um, curriculum in Maryland schools is disrupted and overthrown so that everyone is adequately educated. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Stitt, appreciate your testimony. Uh, next we have Frank Padanella from the ACLU of Maryland. Hi, uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the time to speak and for your consideration of this important bill. Uh, my name is Frank Patnell. I'm a senior education advocate for the ACLU of Maryland and we support HB 140 with amendments. Um, I've been solely focused on education issues over the past 13 years with the ACLU and the vast majority of our work has been about securing adequate funding for educational programming, um, improving old and deficient school buildings and improving school climate through fair discipline and promoting restorative approaches to address behavioral matters. Um, and I wanna commend you on your efforts um, with, the, uh, with the Kerwin Commission and with an override of the veto, school districts throughout Maryland will have a lot more to offer their students. However, the Kerwin Commission is primarily a bill about funding and resources. And while that is vitally important, there was no attention given to other significant education matters that desperately need an overhaul, including the curriculum. HB 140 is the opportunity to give time to studying and making recommendations on history, culture, and civics as it relates to the curriculum in our schools. Um, we have a, a diverse student body here in Maryland, in Maryland 33%. Um, is black, 20% is uh, Latinx, 7% Asian, and 35% white. We need a curriculum that represents and that is inclusive of our diverse student population. The curriculum must serve to center and affirm and uplift the lives, the history, and culture of our students, especially those of um, black and brown students. In speaking with hundreds of parents and students over the years, it is clear that the content this content is lacking in our schools. And it's important to understand that the omission of this does harm to our children. And conversely, the inclusion of this content and the ability of the teacher to deliver it effectively will serve to help students develop a stronger sense of identity, feel value and pride in their communities. And on a personal note, uh, my parents are immigrants from different countries. And I have to say that my childhood was traumatizing in a lot of ways, especially in school because of my ethnic background and the way I looked, um, I felt lesser. And it took me a long time to work through my own identity issues. And really it was my connection to my mom's side of the family and taking enrichment courses outside of school that helped me value and gain a strong sense of identity. identity. And actually um, it was in Montgomery County at a place called Wat Thai. My mom is from Thailand and I used to go down there for, for uh, courses on the weekends. Um, and the only amendment that we'd like to see here is uh, has to do with the appointments of the commissioners. And we ask that the recommendations of the commissioners come solely and directly from the Black Caucus, the Latino Caucus, Asian Pacific Islander Caucus, and the Women's Caucus um, to be approved by the governor. Um, and to close, I urge you to support, um, I urge your support for this bill with amendment, with that amendment. And let's not make a $4 billion investment in the blueprint bill without overhauling the curriculum. Let's not miss this big piece of the puzzle that presents another big game-changing opportunity to ensure that we are maximizing the potential and lifting up the history and culture of every student in Maryland. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Patinella. Um, all right, members, uh, that's, we've had half uh, the uh, people speak so far. Um, any questions for these first four uh, individuals? All right, uh, thank you. Seeing no questions, we'll go next to uh, Jamal Jones. If I can get my uh, camera out. Hey, everyone. hello everyone. Um, good afternoon, Commission. Good afternoon, everyone who's paying attention and streamed in and tuned into this. Uh, just wanted to come in. Uh, my name is Jamal Jones. I am the co-executive director of the Baltimore Algebra Project, an organization that serves young people in Baltimore City. And we do primarily two things. One is student organizing and the other one is math literacy work. You should check us out. Um, we wanted to come and show support for HB 140. We've been um, very supportive of and appreciative of the delegates work around this. Um, wanted to be very clear and highlight a couple things. One was um, we're in favor of the bill just with amendments. Again, there's a point inside the bill there is a question about who does the appointments but I think 
we've had some conversations about um, that with the delegate and team and figured out just kind of some alternative workarounds with that or like some conversations about the other caucuses and being able to have representation from those folks for the appointments for folks who will be on the commission. And then also just kind of making sure that there is language worked into the bill that explicitly um, labels or identifies anti-racist frameworks um, in terms of the content, in terms of the material, and in terms of the training material. Um, to the point that Frank just made in his testimony, it'd be a really big shame for us to do all of this work to override that for, I mean, override everything for Kerwin, and we still misplace where the money is spent um, and how the money is spent. If educators are not given this capacity or are not given this, uh, these mandates by law, these things won't happen, right? Like we've been talking about how curriculum should be different for a century, I mean, for a very long time, for decades. I remember being in school myself um, a few years ago and actually like seeing my name on a sheet of paper for the first time, and that legitimately made me feel weird as if there wasn't names included in math problems or in word problems or in content before for a long time. But I said to say, like, there is a particular version of alienation that comes from having the curriculum as, standard, as it stands be delivered the way that it is. Um, HB 140 helps us to be able to maneuver the, the curriculum in a way that allows for content experts and particularly racial uh, racial equity experts to be able to try and impact what the curriculum looks like to make it a more equitable um, and fair experience for all students so that that investment that comes from Kerwin and everything else um, actually works out really well for us and we can double down on it and actually use education as an economic development model or an economic development tool and I will end by saying um, in the previous session, um, it's my understanding that this bill had not made it out of set or had not made it out of committee. I really, really urge members of the committee to um, get this bill out of committee, especially if we plan on or have any intentions on um, supporting Kerwin in this override for this session. It All right, thank you, Mr. Jones. Your three minutes was up. Uh, as you were saying, it was time to uh, wrap up. Uh, yep. Uh, thank you for testifying. We next have uh, Desiree Tucker. Hi there. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Desiree Tucker. I am a resident of Frederick County, Maryland. I have a, I'm a parent. I have a, a three-year-old and a seven-year-old. And I just want to tell a brief story. My, um, my son was in first grade here in this county and he brought home a little coloring pamphlet that they, you know, a little coloring booklet that they completed in his first grade class. And it was on Abraham Lincoln. And it said, you know, Abraham Lincoln created the Emancipation Proclamation and then everybody was free, the end. And then the next month he brought home another one that was an MLK little booklet um, that he, colored and brought it home to show it to me. And it said at the end, you know, Martin Luther King fought for equal rights and now everyone's equal and we all live in harmony. It's all great. And I understand that these are, these are little people. And so the curriculum has to speak to little people in a way that they can understand. And that makes sense. But when there are so many gaps and when information just is simply incorrect, that's a huge problem. For me in my house, I can certainly look at that. I can take those booklets and reteach, expand on the story. I can fix, fill in the gaps. There are other children, however, that will not have that opportunity. Children, who are not black or Latino, not you know, who are white students. And they won't necessarily hear that. They'll hear these same half stories over and over and over again. And then when you have an adult say, well, I mean, what's the problem? You know, what are you all complaining about? 
you, you know, you were freed. Uh, you got, you have equal rights. Everybody's all equal. It's all good. What's the problem? So it certainly is very important. I've been pushing very hard here to have that curriculum really looked at closely and evaluated so that it's not only reflective of everyone and our history, because it is everyone's history, but that it also tells the truth and makes sense. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Tucker. And I certainly appreciate your comment uh, about little people. When I uh, was a kid reading my book on Abraham Lincoln that I read so often before I turned the age of 10. And then just by the time of high school, I was so upset that not a, a, a bit of nuance was mentioned in those earlier books and a real whitewashing of the history. And um, I, I felt cheated. And I probably read that Lincoln book 50, 100 times as a kid. So uh, um, I, I do agree that um, it, there's a different way to teach youngsters, but it doesn't have to ignore all nuance. Um, Tina Dove from MSEA. Oh, Tina, your mic is on and yet we can't hear you. It's an unusual problem. I'm not sure why this happens sometimes for people. Does that work? That works. There it is. Oh, that was a user glitch. Uh, I was saying good afternoon to you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for my inaugural uh, testimony of 2021. I'm glad I could be back in Ways and Means. On this day in 1847, Abraham and Sarah Crosswhite with their four children African-Americans who were enslaved in Kentucky escaped the clutches of slave catchers sent to kidnap them. Thanks to the aid of several hundred citizens of Marshall, Michigan, who were detaining the slave catchers, the cross whites were able to successfully evade capture and cross safely into Canada. Their case is believed to be one of the cases that ultimately led to the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. As many of you know, I am a social studies teacher. Um, and I think it's safe to assume that many of you were unaware of the story of the Cross Whites. And I'm confident that there are a great many number of stories that come from our collective history about which you are not aware. Um, this ignorance uh, constitutes erasure. Um, and it's an erasure of our nation's collective story. This legislation, I believe, is at the root of helping to correct that erasure. As you know, MSEA has historically not uh, been in support of state mandated curriculum. We believe instead that deferring to local districts to make these types of determinations on curriculum that's taught in schools is the best way to go. This determination, however, cannot be fully informed if the true sense of what's missing is not had. And as such, we support the creation of the commission that would help to bring clarity um, to that which still needs to be included. And you'll note in my written testimony that we support with an amendment, we'd like to see that the, where the teacher um, designation is in the language that there is a teacher from both the Maryland State Education Association and BTU that are included on the commission. A 2016 study conducted by Stanford University's Graduate School of Education that examined the impact of an ethnic studies course offered to ninth grade students in San Francisco who had below a 2.0 GPA found that attendance for those encouraged to enroll in the class increased by 21 percentage points, the GPA by 1.4 grade points, and credits earned by 23 credits. While the positive effects spanned across gender and racial groups, the greatest effect was seen among boys and Latinx students, and there was also significant effects seen on the GPAs in math and science courses. A 2010 study out of Claremont McKenna College in California, Claremont McKenna University found overwhelming evidence for the positive social and emotional effects of diverse curriculum. And we are all well aware of social emotional issues as it pertains to the pandemic. So we certainly could use any and all efforts to help mitigate and remediate anything related to social and emotional learning. Um, I have a few other data points that I could point to that show the lack and the erasure of LGBTQIA members of the community and women as well. Um, all of them end by, by saying, we need to look at this. We need to do a serious deep dive into this. And per the questions that were asked earlier about uh, Delegate Wilson's bill on HB 11, we believe that this commission could help to answer the questions um, that he seeks to solve or solve the problems that he seeks to solve, but do so even in a more inclusive way to not just focus on 
members of the African American community of which I am a proud member, but also the other members um, of our, our collective family here in Maryland, Latinx community being one of them of which I am also a member. So we ask for a favorable report with our suggested amendments that are included in my written testimony. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Dove. Any question uh, for uh, Mr. Jones, Ms. Tucker, or Ms. Dove? All right, thank you. Uh, seeing none, uh, we did have Mr. Vince McAvoy signed up uh, in opposition. Uh, I don't see him here. And as everyone remembers on Delegate Wilson's bill, he essentially mentioned that he was no longer opposing. I, I can only guess that's why he didn't say for this one as well, but uh, I guess one should not always assume. Uh, but um, since he's not here, we will move on to the next bill. Thank you all again uh, for testifying on House Bill 140. We appreciate your involvement in the democratic process. And we are gonna go back to uh, Delegate Riley, who I already apologized to her for not keeping her here before, because uh, when she got here, uh, she then had one more bill that was sponsor only. So she is back uh, to do House Bill 283. Thank you, Delegate. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, let me go over here and get my document. Okay. Uh, good afternoon again, uh, Chair Kaiser and Ways and Means Committee members. Uh, here for the record, Delegate Trace Riley here to introduce HB 283, Harford County Board of Education, term of appointed members. HB 283, as amended, temporarily changes the terms of the next Harford County School Board appointed members beginning July 1st, 2023. The three members appointed by the governor after the 2022 gubernatorial election will have a two-year term ending June 30th, 2025. The three members appointed by the governor in 2025 shall convert back to a four-year term starting July 1, 2025 and ending June 30th, 2029. The purpose for HB 283 is to put the elected and the appointed members in a staggered schedule. The elected members run during the general election, during the gubernatorial election year. And now with this change, the appointed members will not be appointed until the um, following the general election during the presidential year. Um, so there, every two years, that's when we'll have a turnover. So that, that will essentially stagger it and um, we'll have continuity on the board where not all elected and all appointed leave the same time. Um, so I respectfully ask for a favorable vote as amended uh, on HB 283, Harford County um, Board of Education term of the appointed members. And if you notice, um, tomorrow, this will be, or we're hoping it to be a Harford County delegation bill. Uh, we have um, discussed this in delegation, uh, but we wanted to wait until we received the letter from the school board, uh, which we do have, and you have that, I believe, up in your packet, that they approve of this, of this um, legislation, and that is in there. So we will be voting tomorrow morning at our delegation meeting, and then I will send you that momentarily after that. So thank you, and I any questions? Thank you, Delegate Riley. Again, it's great to have you back in Ways and Means, if only for a few minutes. Um, any questions for Delegate Riley? All right, thank you so much, Delegate thank Riley. Thank you. Uh, we'll next move on to a bill from uh, one of my delegates, uh, Delegate Queen, House Bill 83. Welcome, Delegate Queen. Delegate Queen, I see you in the room. Are you there? All right. Um, we might have to jump to another bill. Give me um, one moment. Uh, looking at the um, looking at the time and and um, um, Delegate Wilkins, I think this hearing is gonna go past four o'clock. Would you like to go now, but then you won't be able to hear all the testimony or would you like to go at four when you come back? I could go now, Madam Chair. All right, to members, uh, House. we're gonna to move to House Bill 155 from Delegate Wilkins. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and thank you for uh, accommodating a scheduling challenge that I have. Um, colleagues, I am pleased to present HB 155. This legislation prohibits discrimination in schools for pre-K through 12 students enrolled in schools that receive public funding. And I'm proud that this committee has passed this legislation both through the committee and also through the House for the last two years. As you know, Maryland currently has a patchwork of anti-discrimination provisions, and for some types of schools, there's no codified language at all. This bill creates clear anti-discrimination protections for all of our students. Discrimination including expelling, withholding privileges from or otherwise discriminating against the student, whether it's because of race, ethnicity, color, religion, sex, age, national origin, marital status, sexual orientation, gender identity, or disability is absolutely wrong in our schools, no matter what type of school it is that receives state funding. So this bill requires each local board of education to adopt and maintain a written anti-discrimination policy for the school system that prohibits specified discrimination. It also ensures that each non-public kindergarten program um, and non-public primary and secondary schools that receive state funds develop and maintain a written anti-discrimination policy as well, and also creates a dispute resolution process for when there are complaints. I urge a favorable report on HB 155, and I believe this is the year that we will achieve full passage. Thank you. Well, thank you, Delegate Wilkins. Are there any questions for Delegate Wilkins? Thank you, Delegate. Uh, I'll next move on to uh, some of the people who signed up to uh, speak today. We'll start with uh, Leslie Margolis from Disability Rights Maryland. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair and um, Mr. Vice Chair. Again, for the record, my name is Leslie Margolis. I'm a managing attorney with Disability Rights Maryland, and I'm here this afternoon on behalf of the Education Advocacy Coalition, which is made up of um, approximately 30 organizations and individuals concerned with special education issues um, throughout Maryland. So as we have in the past, um, we are here today um, in support of House Bill 155. Um, we firmly believe that if a private school is receiving state funding, it ought not to discriminate against children with disabilities. Um, you know, this bill, um, if it passes, would simply require um, not only that schools not discriminate against children with disabilities, but that they make reasonable accommodations. Um, it would be consistent with the requirements of the Americans with Disabilities Act. We're not saying that every school would have to take every child with a disability, but simply that they have to be um, non-discriminatory in the way that they um, apply their admissions criteria and that they make reasonable accommodations to students who need them. Um, if they want to discriminate, they can do that. They just can't do that with state funding. So um, again, we support and, and hope that um, this bill will, will pass and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you so much, Ms. Margolis. Kaylin Young. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairwoman uh, Kaiser, uh, Vice Chair Washington, to my delegate, Stephanie Smith, uh, and to members of the committee. Um, so my name is Kaylin Young, Public Policy Director at the ACLU of Maryland. Um, and we're here in support of House Bill uh, 155 um, which would you know, prevent discrimination um, with regard to private schools um, that receive public funding. Um, this bill, as you know, as the delegate mentioned, Delegate Wilkins mentioned, has been passed through this committee. We're just asking again that uh, you hold on to that commitment and that good public policy decision uh, that you made previously. This bill uh, codifies the MSDE guidelines uh, around discrimination. Uh, it creates the, create, the, the complaint and remedy process. Uh, so that way those who are discriminated against can uh, get that remedy also prohibits uh, re retaliation uh, for those who submit those complaints and requires uh, written policies for schools to protect the civil rights of students. Um, the ACLU just wants to remind everybody that you know, we're talking about children here uh, and making sure that they are treated fairly. And um, that is a good public policy for this legislature uh, to maintain. And we urge a favorable report uh, for this bill. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Young. Uh, Jeremy Lamaster. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Chairman and committee members for having me here today. My name is Jeremy Lamaster. My pronouns are he, him, and they, them. And I am the Executive Director for Free State Justice, Maryland's LGBTQ Advocates. 
Uh, Free State Justice is a statewide uh, policy advocacy and legal services organization. And we represent hundreds of LGBTQ folks, including youth across the state um, who come from low income uh, families. Last year, or, or sorry, two years ago at this point, we conducted a statewide needs assessment um, and a listening tour to really get a sense of the issues um, impacting Maryland um, LGBTQ community. And regardless of where we were in the state, um, in, in all counties, the top two issues that came back consistently were education um, and healthcare. Um, majority of Maryland LGBTQ students felt unsafe, over 60%. Um, and 65% of those students reported being harassed or assaulted at school based on their orientation or gender identity. Um, most students never reported this incident to school staff and only a third of them um, who reported uh, these incidents felt that the incident was addressed and resolved. Um, less than 15% of students reported that their schools had comprehensive anti-discrimination, anti-bullying policies. And these situations have very significant uh, impacts on youth. Um, not just on their educational and learning experience, um, but their very livelihood and their health. Um, this bill is very important in ensuring that comprehensive non-discrimination policies um, you know, are enacted uh, broadly across the state, um, that we don't have a patchwork county by county, district by district interpretation and enforcement of non-discrimination policies. Um, and then this bill is really important in setting up a clear process by which students and families um, can make sure that their complaints are being heard and being addressed um, appropriately and ethically and in affirming ways. Um, evidence shows that you know, schools that do adopt these types of policies um, have improved um, experiences for LGBTQ youth. Uh, students are more likely to report incidents and those incidents are more likely um, to be addressed. Um, so it, it is in our um, opinion uh, at Free State Justice um, to favor this bill um, and a favorable report on it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lamaster. Uh, we do have a few others, but to, to break it up a little bit, are there any questions for Ms. Margolis, Mr. Young, or Mr. Lamaster? All right. Uh, seeing none, thank you all very much. Appreciate your testifying. Uh, next, we have Tina Dove. Back so soon. Tina Dev with MSCA. Um, as I've said numerous times before this committee, this bill is simply about providing every child with a safe and inclusive school environment, one that respects each and every student. It is also about ensuring that every student who attends a school funded in whole or in part by public dollars are provided equal protection under both federal and state law. The acceptance of public funding by a non-public school is not mandatory, it is purely voluntary. If the non-public school does not wish to abide by the law, they can choose to either refrain from engaging in discriminatory practices against any student, or they can choose to not accept public funding. The edicts of this bill are not new to any public school or other recipients of public funds. They too are required to adhere to federal and state laws. In this case, the laws specifically relate to prohibitions against discriminatory practices. And it's worth noting that in, in situations here in the state where public schools have not adhered to these provisions, there have been legal remedies that were brought about. So this is about equality for all schools, public and private that receive public funding. For non-public schools who currently participate in the textbook and technology program, the boost voucher program and the non-public aging schools program, they're required to sign assurances explicitly stating that they will comply with federal and state prohibitions against discrimination as a condition of their participation. This legislation merely seeks to codify these requirements for all recipients of public funding so as to protect all of our federal and state recognized protected classes. If the events of 2020 taught us nothing, it taught us that discrimination against anyone is no longer acceptable or ex is no longer excusable or acceptable under any circumstances or due to any justification. All of our schools should be supportive, healthy, and safe teaching and learning environments. And this is particularly the case for those schools who receive public tax dollars. I have implored you all numerous occasions when I've come before you that as a person of color who has all of her life in some way, shape or form been subjected to microaggressions, discriminatory actions, whether they were implicit or not, and have noted the damage that that has imparted upon me. It is essential for me as an educator to do everything that is necessary to fight to make sure that no child has to go through that in the way in which I have. This legislation protects all of our babies, no matter how they show up in the world. And it is deplorable 
if we can go into 2021 and say that it is still acceptable to fund discriminatory practices against a child under any circumstances. We ask for a favorable report of HB 155. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Dove. And then we also have Lou Wadarian. Sorry if I've uh, pronounced it. It's not a problem at all. Um, thank you for having me here, Chairwoman and members of the committee. My name is Lou Wetterin, and I am a senior at Richard Montgomery High School, but I'm also here today as president of MoCo Pride, a student-led LGBT advocacy group. I am here to, on behalf of my fellow students and the members of my organization because I am fortunate enough to be able to come before you all today and expect no dire consequences for my actions. And I do mean that I am fortunate. In many ways, my security arises from luck. To take an example, for me, having my name changed on the school roster was a relatively painless process for three reasons. One, Richard Montgomery, my high school, makes an effort to be inclusive and attentive to students. Two, I have a strong mother who's always on my side. And three, my mom was a teacher at that school. My friend had two, the first two of these three advantages. And yet, when, without my connections, when he, was, when he asked to change his name on the school roster, he was asked to provide legal documents for this change, which was a discouraging and humiliating process for him. In a strange display of nepotism, my mother's position allowed me to avoid unnecessary hoops and distress. But a student's rights shouldn't revolve around who they are connected with. In schools, LGBT students form our own support networks. We're banding together to protect ourselves. We pass out flyers and documents in meetings about what our legal rights are and what we can expect from our schools. While other students warn their friends, watch out, Mrs. X is a harsh grader, or promise Mr. Y is flexible with deadlines, we tell each other, be careful. Mr. A will not like calling you by a different name, or if you're in trouble, go to Mrs. B, she'll help you out. School is already difficult, but trying to pass a class with a teacher that has a grudge against you is near impossible. This is why we need this bill, the Inclusive Schools Act, because students will not speak up unless there's protection against retaliation. We, the students of Maryland, look up to you. All over the state, there are kids dreaming of being where you are and making their community a better and safer place. So I'm asking you to honor the trust placed in you as adults, parents, and leaders. Please support the Inclusive School Act Bill 0155 and protect your students. Thank you for your consideration. Uh, thank you, Lou. Again, always love to have High school students, um, I'm impressed with the work you're doing, though I, um, as a Rockville High School graduate, I have to, you know, mention that you do go to our rival high schools. So, um, you know, maybe we have some differences there. Uh, but again, really appreciate you being here. Uh, we next have Joel Hurwitz signed up to testify. Is Mr. Hurwitz here? Yes, I good see. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I live in Howard County in Delegate Ebersole in Delegate Velmark's District 12. About a year ago, when the Howard County public school system was discussing what to do with the parochial busing, I ended up writing a very long memorandum to the county council dealing with the law that's included in the memo I submitted to you. I concluded that over the years, they weren't really following the, the language of the law in one that money this was coming not from real property taxes and two it says three times to schools not receiving state aid I concluded that many of the schools had been receiving participating in state aid through the textbook and boost scholarship and aid to non-public uh, aging public school and safety improvement funds however in 2018 bethel christian academy and i submitted the newspaper article was kicked out of the programs for allegedly violating the non-discrimination provisions. I ended up using much of their own legal uh, court filings to argue that they basically were receiving state aid. Thus, I concluded that to receive parochial busing in Howard County, you had to not be receiving state aid. And since Bethel Christian Academy had been kicked out, it was now ironically eligible for the parochial busing. 
therefore I was hoping you would expand the scope of the provision to include uh, private and parochial busing provided by a local board of education, because in this situation, it's a little ironic that you get kicked out of one program for violating the non-discrimination rules, making you eligible for another one. So if you have any questions, and I previously had submitted uh, links to the memo to a delegate, Sarah Sol and Phil Mark, if they wanted to dig into all the details. Thank you so much. Thank you to all three of you for uh, testifying. We do have a, a question, uh, Delegate Buckle. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I guess I just wanted to ask, the, the last gentleman just mentioned the Bethel Christian Academy case. Does anyone know of any other circumstances where all of these things that have been alluded to have actually occurred or been alleged to have occurred? Because I, I tried to do a pretty good research analysis of anyone coming and saying my child was impermissibly discriminated against by a private school with respect to these issues encompassed by the legislation. And the only one I could find was Bethel Christian Academy. Uh, and my understanding is, is that under prior law, not this bill, because this bill's never become law, under prior law, existing law, a federal court has already determined that Bethel Christian Academy would be excluded from receiving governmental funds. I don't know if that's on appeal or if that's been, you know, conclusively adjudicated or settled between the parties. But, but my question, if anybody knows, is honestly, do we need this bill? It seems like there's already rules out there and laws out there which prohibit discrimination in, in a lot of forms, which is a good thing. Uh, and I'm wondering, it doesn't seem like there's a history of, uh, of a lot of complaints and a lot of notoriety about complaints about these things. And it seems like the one school that, that really did have uh, a, a set of complaints has already been excluded from participating in programs under existing law. So why is it that you guys think that this bill is particularly different or necessary, you know, after three years? Anyway. Um. I, I'm happy to take that on, uh, sure. Delegate Buckle. So thank you for the question. First and foremost, what I would say to you is that you are largely probably not hearing anything about these because a number of the schools have non-disparagement clauses built into their um, guidelines and whatnot, which make it impossible for families to speak out about any issues that they have related to their school without the risk of, of having retaliation against them. The second I will present to you, and, and I defer to my colleagues at ACLU who can speak in more, uh, more in depth on this issue. Um, we have brought to Ways and Means before the incident involving two mothers of a child in a Prince George's County school that was um, a, a recipient of public funding. Um, they were declined participation in a tea party. Um, they, what they were told was it was a mom's tea party. Both moms wanted to participate. They were told only one mom could participate and given a variety of different reasons as to why that was the case. But what it ultimately was, was out of a concern that having two moms show up for the same child would be problematic. Um, so the, these incidences are occurring. Um, and to your question about the Bethel Ministries case, that is still ongoing in the Fourth Circuit. Um, I do not believe to my knowledge that it has been um, that it has been settled in any way, I believe it is yeah, still ongoing. May I okay. also may I also address that that question? Uh, yes, again, Leslie. Um, we are also aware of a school that on its website had language um, saying that students would be admitted for a six week trial period, but that if it turned out that they had any special needs. Um, any physical needs, any other kinds of, any learning needs that they would not be able to attend the school. So um, that was a very explicit um, provision in, on their website, discriminating against children with disabilities. Well, that, that's my, my final question is, is this bill going to be construed because it does relate to uh, discrimination or refusing enrollment related to disability? And I'm certainly aware, and I think most people are aware of a tremendous amount of, of private schools, whether they be parochial schools or otherwise, that are older schools, not wealthy schools by any stretch of the imagination. And many of them simply don't have the financial wherewithal to have the full range of, uh, 
um, accommodations that particular students with disabilities, certain types of disabilities may need, whether they be uh, physical in nature to get students in and out safely out of the buildings to and from classroom floors, or whether they be uh, special education disability needs in terms of programs, programmatic uh, assets. Would this bill somehow be construed to say that those private schools that are saying, hey, we, we don't wanna discriminate against anyone with a disability. We, we love your kid. We'd love to be as helpful as what we can, but we just don't have the, uh, the physical ability, the financial ability to provide the structure and the, and the necessary accommodation for your kid. Are they now liable for some type of, of violation of law and financial penalty if we pass this bill? Uh, yes, Margolis. Safe please. Harbor. Yeah, absolutely not, um, right. Delegate. So the the key um, the key piece of this is the requirement that that the schools provide reasonable accommodation, and what's reasonable is going to depend on on the school. Sure. So the school that has lots and lots of money. Um, a reasonable accommodation may look very different from a school that doesn't or a school that was built in 1850 as opposed to a, to a modern school. So, so it, what, reason, what reasonable is, is going to depend on the circumstances. And as long as a school has offered reasonable accommodation, if, it, if, if that's not going to be a good fit, um, it, that's all that they've had to offer. And nobody is saying and nothing about this bill requires that the private school recreate what the student would be would be offered if the student were in the public school system. All that's offered, all that's required, is that reasonable accommodation be be offered to the student. I appreciate that. In my field of what I do for a living as an attorney, the definition of reasonable is usually determined by a judge. Uh, we don't come back in the legislature and say this is reasonable, that's not reasonable. It, it always winds up being some judicial actor that says it is or is not reasonable. And that's one of my only concerns. I, I love the concept of the litigate or the, excuse me, the legislation. Uh, I'm just concerned that what we're going to wind up happening is an awful lot of lawsuits and a lot of resources that are spent not helping children, but are spent litigating back and forth. But I, I, that's not really a question. I, I appreciate it. Uh, Delegate Buckle, if, if I might, sure. I would defer you to page you, four of the bill. Um, uh -huh. Lines 11 through 14 refer to the language around right. the um, reasonable accommodations language. Right. So that I hope would assuage any concerns that you might have. Okay. Thank you, Tina. All right. Uh, thank you all very much. Um, Delegate Long with a question. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the question I have is, is uh, leading off what Delegate Buckle mentioned, uh, public schools, if they don't have reasonable uh, accommodations, uh, is the language based the same as we're going to uh, look at like a public school that cannot do the same thing? You know, uh, reasonable accommodations, is that what this is going to be based on? Anyone can answer that question. Uh, Delegate Long, thank you for the question. This, The way this legislation is written, it would apply, these provisions would apply equally to public and non-public because anyone who is the recipient of public funding. So public schools would be in the same boat of having to provide reasonable accommodations as is already the case. Right, and the reason I asked this question because in our district we have a lot of older schools and a lot of them couldn't uh, facilitate someone with uh, in a wheel, wheelchair or something of that nature. And I'm just curious, uh, you know, litigation, I, I'm just curious, thank you. So public, public schools are under additional requirements because there is a federal special education law, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, and then federal, because public school systems also receive federal funding, they have to comply with Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. So public school systems have to comply with federal special education law, they have to comply with Section 504, and they also have to comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act. So, so they're, under, they're under many more requirements than the private schools that we're talking about in this bill would be, would be required, you know, subjected to. Uh, Thank you for that clarification. Madam Chair, if I could. Um, Please, go ahead. Um, if we have a school that's not in compliance with ADA compliance, uh, existing school, what, how would that work? I'm just, you know, given they're under federal guidelines and state guidelines, 
but they're not made to come up to ADA specifications. I'm just curious, how's that differ from a private school? So, so I, I can I can address that, um, delegate. Not every school in every school district has to be ADA or Section 504 compliant. There has to be, again, reasonable accommodations have to be made, and it may be possible to serve a child in um, in a school with accommodations. It may be absolutely not possible. It might be that school is uh, is in a historic building and, and right. meant to be modified, but there's another school close to the family's home, and and that might be a considered a reasonable placement for the for the child. And um, the operative issue is that the school system has to look at all the circumstances, but not every single school in every single school district has to be fully physically accessible. So if you have a lot of old buildings, mm -hmm. um, they don't all have to be. And there, are, and there also is another federal law that, that deals with architectural barrier and, and access issues. So there are a lot of things that come into play, but, but not every building has to be fully accessible to every single person. All right, well, thank you. All right, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, we have one person signed up. I'm not sure if he has come back, uh, Mr. Vince McAvoy, who was here earlier. Are you, are you here again, Mr. McAvoy? Just giving a moment. Uh, it's hard always to scroll through the list, uh, but I don't see him here. Uh, we are done with the uh, hearing on House Bill uh, 155. Uh, we're going back to um, uh, Delegate Queen's bill. House Bill 83. Delegate Queen, welcome. Thank you, I'm trying to get unmuted and show my face. How's everyone? Good, Thank we're you. delighted to see you. Good to see you all too. Thank you for the opportunity. I want to first recognize this Delegate Pam Queen, uh, sponsor of HB 83. This is a bill that uh, you have heard last session. Um, it's regarding uh, chronic retractable room partitions. And uh, I'm sorry, greetings, Chair. PJ, how you doing? Chairman Kaiser. I'm uh, and Chair. watching Pam uh, Queen testify. Hey, Delegate Buckle, you need to mute yourself. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you let me testify. I him. Let's keep going, <laughs> Delegate Queen. Vice Chair Washington and members of the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, HB 83 is a bill that you heard before last session and is related to an issue that one of our uh, neighboring jurisdictions, Fairfax uh, County uh, encountered. Uh, you may be all familiar in many of our schools, we have these large um, uh, gyms and uh, rooms that we often partition with these large partitions to uh, separate areas. And so what happened was in that process, a student got caught in the petition and actually died. So, you know, sometimes when we go into a, a uh, elevator and you kind of put your hand in there and once the, the door starts to close, then it opens up automatically. It, it senses that there's a person there. This is not the case for those large petitions. And so what this bill seeks to do is to provide some standards that we would have guidelines that we would have on the operation of such uh, partitions, uh, making sure that everyone is trained on the proper use of those partitions and that there are regular reviews to make sure things are operational and to make sure children aren't in uh, close proximity when these partitions are being used. And so this bill also was cross file in the Senate SB 104, but it really is just a proactive way of making sure we have legislation in place that provides guidelines that's across the board so that we can ensure safety of our children. That's it. Thank you. Uh, any questions of the sponsor of the bill? So I can uh, give you one second, everybody.
taking over. Okay, uh, seeing, no, seeing no questions for the sponsor of the bill, let's move on to the witness list. Uh, first witness we have up is uh, uh, Leslie Magolis. No, you're on the wrong bill. It should be. Oh, here. shoot, I'm on the wrong Amy, bill. I apologize. Um, Amy Salmon. Yes, got it. Hold on one second. House Bill 83. I, what, how, what bill was that? House Bill 83. Yeah, I think Amy should be from uh, Montgomery County, our um, Salmon. She's uh, Montgomery County's uh, government liaison. Okay, uh, let's have her speak next. I apologize for bringing up the bill now. Amy, go ahead. Good afternoon, Chair Kaiser, Vice Chair Washington, and members of the committee. My name is Amy Simon. I'm here on behalf of Montgomery County in support of House Bill 83. Um, as Delegate Queen mentioned, there have been several fatalities over the last couple of decades um, with states implementing similar measures to this one. This is a pretty straightforward, simple measure that gives schools the flexibility on how they want to handle it with several options. Um, some, you know, putting electronic sensor on or just simply not allowing children in the school or in the room. Um, and we think this would prevent this, the safety hazard from uh, safety hazard from happening going forward. We appreciate Delegate Queen introducing this important legislation and respectfully request a favorable committee report. Thank you. Thank you, any questions? Seeing none, that concludes the um, the bill hearing on House Bill 83. Okay, thank you for second. your time. Thank you, Delegate. Give me one second, everybody. Next bill we'll have up is House Bill uh, 273, Delegate Turner. Ah, uh, yes. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the Ways and Means and Vice Chair Alonzo, Delegate Alonzo Washington. Thank you. I'm happy to be with you again. This is my second visit. My name is Delegate Veronica Turner and I am here to introduce House Bill HB 273. This bill will require the Maryland State Department of education to establish a voluntary ethical um, ethical special ed advocacy program to provide added protection for our most viable student population by creating an avenue for parents to navigate the special education system when their students need additional support. This means getting accommodation for individual education plans and the 504 plan to help with ensuring that they are imp implemented. I must tell you that although we had the best bill drafters in the county, it has been very, very busy year for bill drafting. This bill was not drafted properly and does not include language that would incorporate many of the concerns that were raised last year. Day Devon Percy is here to speak to some of the proposed amendments and he will speak on this shortly. However, the bill will assist parents in locating service for their students when schools either don't recognize or who are not following proper protocol to assist students who falls through the crack. 
Highly functioning students often use coping skills to struggle through their academic careers and parents know there may be help available, but don't know where to turn. This bill will allow them to find someone who is certified to help if they do not know anyone personally who can help them. This program is voluntary in the voluntarily and this program just creates a way to certify people who want to help or advocate that to verify that they know how to help. Once again, you heard the proposed amendment. I ask that you give HB 273 a favor report. And thank you again for coming back to see Ways and Means Committee. Well, thanks for being back, Delegate. Uh, we have two speakers on this bill. We have first uh, Angela Mizzomo and then Davion Percy followed by. Thank you. Good afternoon, committee chair, vice chair, and members. My name is Dr. Helen Angela Mazomo, and I'm a licensed certified speech language pathologist with over 30 years of experience. I'm here today on behalf of the Maryland Speech Language Hearing Association. Prior to coming to Maryland, I worked in New York and New Jersey. During my time in working in New York, I served not only as a speech language pathologist, but also volunteered to support and advocate for parents who struggled with understanding the special education process. I continue to provide voluntary advocacy through the New York State Office for People with Developmental Disabilities via their surrogate decision-making committee. Over the past 15 years, working as a speech language pathologist providing services in Maryland, I've heard from many people about the difficulties of finding an effective, affordable advocate. I've heard the stories of families who have not been able to find an advocate, who have taken out second mortgages on their homes or have done without other needed services for themselves or their children in order to afford an advocate. I've heard the stories of families who are essentially lost at sea with the overwhelming number of local and federal laws, the acronyms that are used and what can often be a terrifying situation. I've met with parents who are in tears because they're so frustrated and concerned for their child. I've met with parents who have searched for an advocate and who have been unable to find one. I've met with parents who found the wrong advocate and it cost them dearly. I spent a considerable amount of time last summer contacting multiple advocates in an attempt to help a family who did not know where to even begin to look. In past years, opposition to this bill has pointed out the same concerns. However, throughout all of this, what I've not heard is a solution to this problem. I've only heard objections to a possible solution without an alternative being offered. All of this leads me to believe that the current system of finding and hiring advocates, especially knowledgeable advocates, is not effective and that parents are left without the support they need. Passage of this bill could help by creating a central list of special education advocates who demonstrate knowledge in the area of special education law. This doesn't require a specific degree. It would not prevent parents from bringing in additional people as support. It would simply create a place for parents to go to find a knowledgeable advocate to provide needed guidance and support. Clearly, what has been going on in the past isn't working. Isn't it time to try something else? I hope you give a favorable report on this bill. Thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Percy. Good afternoon, uh, uh, Chair and uh, Mr. Vice Chair, respective members of the committee for the record, Davion Percy with Percy Public Affairs here with uh, and on behalf of the Maryland Speech Language Hearing Association in support of this bill. Uh, this bill has been before this committee uh, 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 several times, uh, at least uh, four times since I've been uh, here in Annapolis. So I won't go into great detail. Most of you all are familiar with what the bill does. Uh, Delegate Turner, thank you so much for sponsoring the bill. Uh, and to Delegate Turner's point, uh, last year uh, in, in working with uh, the chairman of, uh, of um, uh, Chairman Pinsky in the Senate, we made some changes to the bill uh, to ensure that we, um, we uh, add a little more detail 
um, on what the requirements are for, for testing and qualification. Um, unfortunately, uh, this year the bill was drafted uh, was drafted as introduced and not as amended. So we're working expeditiously uh, with uh, with the amendment office to get that uh, get those changes put in there. And we do believe that it will address many of the concerns um, of the advocates on the other side. Uh, so generally, you know what this bill simply does. Just want to uh, paint a picture here uh, for you. Uh, just envision a toolbox. Uh, most of us have toolboxes in our homes, our cars, et cetera, uh, um, and they're full of all different kinds of tools that we use to fix all kinds of things around our, around our, our house and even in our offices. Um, and every now and then we run into a problem and we learn uh, when we go into our toolbox that we don't have a tool to fix this particular problem. So we don't replace the tools. We don't throw away the tools. We go to Home Depot or a hardware store and we buy the tool that we need and we add that tool into the toolbox um, so that we can address this problem. Um, contrary to what some of the advocates allege, uh, this bill does not replace attorneys who have special training and education in, in special education law. It does not replace full-time professional advocates. Um, it does not uh, eliminate the need uh, for any of those other professionals. It simply adds another tool in the toolbox for parents who can't afford uh, that high price attorney um, um, or those uh, the, the other advocates and professionals that are in this field. This is all that we're trying to do. Um, we believe that there should be no reason for us to object um, to adding tools um, into the toolbox of parents who want to advocate for their children and ensure that they have a, the best education possible. So, you know, we truly hope that we can reach uh, some sort of agreement this year and get this bill moved and to the floor. Uh, with that, I uh, thank you all and we certainly urge a favorable report. Thank you, Mr. Percy and uh, doctor. Uh, any questions, uh, Delegate Guyton? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that you brought this bill to us, Delegate Turner. And um, I appreciate the explanation of some of the amendments that might possibly occur with the, the bill as we move forward. Um, I certainly care very, very much about the disabilities community and talk to parents and students all the time and know that there is a big problem with not having enough advocates who really know what, they, what they're doing. My concern looking at the language of this bill, and it may be because it's not complete, is that I'm still not sure what it does. And, and I don't mean that to be insulting in any way. I'm not sure whether what I'm looking at right now, reading through the language is a volunteer core or whether these are going to be paid advocates, um, what sort of training that they would be required to have and whether the Department of Education would then be liable for any sort of mal malpractice that they would have. There are, there are a whole lot of unanswered questions. I would love to move forward with this and move the needle in the direction of having more advocacy and more support for families. Um, but I, I do wanna be careful how we do it. Can you address any of those questions specifically about some of the holes in this bill? Yes, um, uh, thank you, Delegate Guyton for, for bringing up those concerns. I think you will be pleased uh, based on what you, uh, what you stated of what the uh, changes will be. Um, uh, the, the amendments detail uh, will detail uh, what the training requirements are. Um, and what the standard is uh, uh, for testing. Um, it would also um, address uh, the issue of, um, we'll certainly make sure that we address the issue of, of, of holding the, uh, the department harmless of uh, any potential malpractice by any of those who are certified. We're not creating a volunteer corps. Uh, we're calling it voluntary because we don't wanna make this a requirement. We don't want to require the attorney who's been to law school um, um, and it specializes in this area to go back and certify in special education. Uh, uh, so we just wanted to make it uh, clear that we're not requiring those who advocate to have this certification, but those who choose to, uh, to get this certification. And what will happen is once the certification is obtained, parents who engage advocates in that class will be able to verify whether or not this advocate is certified through the established training um, um, through M MSDE and has gone through that process uh, to be adequately certified to provide those services. Hopefully that answers your question. Well, the one question that I still don't have answered is, so through this program, it, it reads, and again, I can't wait to see the, the changes, please send them to me, but it reads as if you can certify someone with, within this program if they've attended a webinar and if they've been to law school and have worked in this field. And I don't know that those would be equivalent. 
Right. So, um, um, so if they, um, the, the, if they attended the uh, training, they'd be able to be certified. And then those who have been to law school, they can choose if they want to certify, but right. it's not, it's not required. So anyone operating in this field can go through the process and certify. And that's going to be made very clear uh, okay. in the amendment that we hope to get within the next couple of days. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, that concludes the public hearing for uh, that bill. We're gonna go for HB 273. We're gonna go to Delegate Boyce's bill, uh, which is a sponsor only bill, House Bill 400. Delegate Boyce. Thank you so much. So um, honored to be with the Ways and Means Committee today. Um, Ways and Means uh, Chair, Vice Chair and Committee members. For the record, I am Regina T. Boyce, testifying on HB 400 Enrollment Location Continuity. HB 400 prohibits a county superintendent from withdrawing a child from enrollment in a school that the child is attending due to the child's participation in an educational program that is located in a detention facility as state owned and state operated facility that accommodates more than 25 youth or any other facility operated primarily for detention of youth who are determined to be delinquent. In November 2019, on a visit to both the Baltimore Juvenile Center and the Evening Reporting Center, I discovered a concerning issue. Youth entering the Baltimore Center were being withdrawn from school upon the transfer of their school record to the Baltimore Center from the school system. The Department of Juvenile Services provides educational programs through MSDE um, at the center. These centers are not schools. The additional concern is the barrier this transfer creates. Resources at the centers are used to re-enroll students back into school, which requires several pieces of documentation, a birth certificate and two or three proofs of residency. And this re-enrollment into the youth, um, the school the youth was just enrolled in anywhere from 10 to 30 days prior. According to the Department of Juvenile Services in FY18, youth detained at the Baltimore Center and the juvenile system on average had a stay of 18 days. There were 661 youth admitted to the detention pre-trial. On any given day, there are about 32 youth charged as juveniles at the Baltimore Center. A majority of youth are released from detention back to the community. Also in FY18, youth detained at the Baltimore Center as adults on average had a stay of 149 days. 141 youth charged as adults are admitted to the Baltimore Center's uh, pre-transfer. On any given day, about 57 youth are charged as adults. 45% of the youth charged as, a, as adults are released back to the community. Uh, this is a rough um, total of about 89 youth who may not be heading back to school. Youth who come into the system tend to have high absenteeism. Upon entering the system, these youth can receive needed resources for themselves and for their parents to address the underlining issues regarding the absenteeism, as well as the underlining issues that brought them to the center to begin with. Note that this does not occur as it should because the resources are being used to mainly re-enroll the youth back into school. That is the this is a state issue and not just a Baltimore City issue. In the second year of the Blueprint for Maryland's Future, no child should be left behind um, from receiving a world-class education, even those who may have taken a wrong path. The simple correction of this issue will ensure these youth are not left behind and two, have access to the Blueprint for Maryland's Future, um, Future's provisions for world-class competitive education. I would like to mention that uh, this bill did pass this committee last year, 21 to 1, and the House 132 to 0 um, as HB 1188. So I would thank you again for your time and your consideration, and I urge a favorable report again, please. Thank you so much. Thank you, Delegate Boyce. You should, you should lead with that next time. Uh, <laughs> I, I have to be gracious. I'm at the mercy of the <laughs> No, it's all good. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you so any, much. Any questions? Delegate, you have a question? No? no. Okay. I, I do want to say that this discovery was made um, upon a tour um, of the Baltimore County and then um, detention center with um, Senator West and Delegate Guyton. And then it continued on 
when I end up having to do an additional tours of, of those, um, the Baltimore City Detention Center. So um, this is something I know uh, she too is very interested in and um, in support. So thank you, Delegate Guyton. Thank you very much. That concludes the public hearing for this bill. Uh, we're gonna move on to- Thank uh, you so much. Thank you to Delegate uh, Resnick's bill, House Bill 205. Uh, he's a, this is a sponsor only bill. Delegate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the Ways and Means Committee. Um, I'm here presenting House Bill 205, uh, provision to mandate uh, menstrual hygiene products in public schools. Uh, this is a bill that you all passed last year and it was passed out of the house. Um, it did not make it across the street because of the shortened session. So we are back um, trying to get the bill through again this time. Um, unlike last year, I have a fantastic Senate sponsor. So I, I have very high hopes that we gets gets all the way to the finish line this year. Uh, I do know we have a few new members on this committee and I wanted to refresh everyone's memory. So I'm just gonna take a minute or two to remind everybody what this bill does. Uh, this bill would require our public schools to provide some variety of menstrual products uh, in school bathrooms at no charge to the students. All Maryland schools already purchase some of these products, but they're kept in health centers or nurses offices and students need to get permission to leave class and go ask a nurse for these products instead of simply just going to a bathroom and getting what they need. On average, a woman will spend seven years of their lives menstruating and will use approximately 17,000 pro menstrual products over that period of time. An estimated 81% of American women have said that they have gotten their periods unexpectedly and didn't have the necessary products on hand at any given time. OSHA, the Federal Occupation Safety and Health Administration, has strict requirements about the supply of toilet paper, paper towels and hand soaps for all commercial buildings and bathrooms. This includes school. No one is asked to bring their own toilet paper, hand soap and paper towels to bathrooms to use and those items are provided free to everyone. Why? Because they're basic bodily supplies needed to accommodate basic bodily functions. Menstruation is not an illness, it's not an injury, it's not a health emergency. It's a perfectly normal biological function. It is not something that can be turned off and on or held in until it's convenient. By requiring students to go to the school nurse to get a, a menstrual hygiene product, we are sending the message that having a period is equated to an illness. It is a burden on both students and staff to require a visit to the nurse's office or the health center to get period supplies. Nurses offices are busy, often understaffed and lack resources. A student having to wait in line to get a pad takes far more time than a simple bathroom trip. It might mean the nurse having to choose between focusing on a student experiencing an actual medical situation or one experiencing a normal, albeit inconvenient bodily function. It is also a very embarrassing moment for the student having to ask the classroom teacher if they can go to the nurse and possibly having to explain why, and then again going to the nurse and having to explain what they need, possibly in the presence of other students and having to explain why they're there and what bodily function they're having versus simply being able to go to the bathroom and take care of it themselves. A recent survey conducted by a youth-led nonprofit focusing on ending period poverty and stigma called period found that 80% of teens who menstruate feel ashamed of it. And 67%, I'm sorry, 76% believe they're actually taught more about the biology of frogs than their own bodies. Ideally, there wouldn't be such a stigma around talking about, around talking about periods, but we as a society have decided that it is not a comfortable discussion for us to have. And so here we are stigmatizing this function. Uh, this stigma is compounded for trans and non-binary students who are already at an increased risk of being bullied and experiencing mental health problems. The concept of period poverty is intrinsically linked with the discussion over providing menstrual products in schools. Period poverty, according to Global Citizen, is the lack of access to sanitary products, menstrual hygiene education, toilets, hand washing facilities, and or other waste management. In addition to the lack of supplies being provided in schools is the fact that menstrual products are often expensive and not covered by programs like food stamps. Families with low and restricted incomes have to budget carefully and set aside funds to buy these products and the time 
when the funds are available may not coincide with when the products are needed. I realize there's a fiscal note on this bill and that the estimated costs are based on average educated guesses. Last year, if you take a look at the same bill last year and it's in the exact same posture um, as was passed out, the fiscal note said that the average cost of a dispenser for one of for these products was $325. This year, for no discernible reason, that number has now dropped to $255. The truth is we don't know what the average cost is going to be for any one school or school system as to which products they wanna buy. But there are inexpensive options, including a $35 option that is described in written testimony that has been submitted to you and is currently being used right now at the University of Baltimore School of Law for this very reason. Schools could even choose to go with a simple basket on the counter if they really wanted to, as long as it was stocked and accessible. This does not have to be an expensive program to estimate, and we cannot take into account average costs in other states in order to figure out what's best for our own schools and our own students. As you have seen last year and this year as well, this bill has received overwhelming support from a wide network of advocates who feel this is an important conversation to have and an easy step to take. New Hampshire, California, New York, Georgia, Illinois, and Virginia have all passed this program. Multiple municipalities and school districts across this country have passed a similar program. Um, last year, I shared with all of you a video uh, produced by the superintendent of schools from Columbus, Ohio, talking about the benefits of the program. And I'm more than happy to reshare that video with everyone as well, if you're interested. Last year, the Baltimore Sun editorial board uh, published an op-ed urging us to take action. Um, so there's a lot of support and this is really a no-brainer bill. I wanna thank this committee for passing it last year. Because of the shortened session, it, uh, we, we couldn't get across the finish line as I mentioned. And I'm hoping and asking that you all pass it again so we can get it done this year. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> thank you, Delegate Resnick. And the, uh, the high school girl in me can definitely relate to not wanting to ask the embarrassing question that I had to do too many times in the nurse's office. So thank you. Uh, any questions for uh, Delegate Resnick? All right. Uh, thank you, Delegate Resnick. As this is sponsor only, we have no other uh, people signed up since this did pass our uh, committee and uh, the House last year. Uh, thank you. To members, we have three more bills of uh, Delegate Guyton, who uh, who wanted to be last today. Uh, Delegate Guyton, I think I think there was an order here. Let's start with House Bill four zero one. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thanks to the Ways and Means Committee. For the record, I am Delegate Michelle Guyton from District forty two B in Baltimore County, and uh, I thank you for your consideration of House Bill four zero one requiring the State Department of Education to establish a model policy to improve the educational outcomes of our 2000 Maryland students who are pregnant or parenting each year. This policy must include adequate provisions for lactating students, including a private space to nurse or to pump and an excusal from class for lactation related needs. So in addition, schools shall assist and advise the student in acquiring appropriate transportation and childcare services if the lack of those services impedes the student's ability to attend school. Um, so this bill was introduced last year by my uh, dear colleague, Alice Kane, and I'm happy to carry it this year. There are quite a few changes between last year's bill and this year's bill. Um, I do wanna say that currently, even before the pandemic, 60% of pregnant and parenting students leave school before they graduate. And over 60% of those, the families that they form live below the poverty line. So given the well-documented advantages to earning at least a high school diploma um, for getting into the job market and supporting your families. I hope that this committee will give HB 401 a favorable report in order to increase the odds that parenting students achieve this academic goal and can better provide for themselves and their children. One of the changes from last year's bill is that I have actually divided this bill into several parts. This is the policy piece of this bill. And this is where you're gonna get most of your information about it from the advocates, which is why I asked that we went first here to save time. Um, uh, just quickly, I won't go through all the groups that have supported this, but it looks like I have about 45 of them who are favorable, many of them on one letter from the 
Coalition to Reform School Discipline members, um, including the ACLU Maryland, Adv Advocates for Children and Youth and the ARC, many, many more, Maryland Catholic Conference, Family Network, Women's Law Center. And I do want to mention that just a few moments ago, I got the thumbs up from the Legislative um, Committee from the Women's Caucus that we also have received their endorsement this year. So I ask for your favorable consideration of this bill. Thank you, Delegate Guyton. Any questions for Delegate Guyton? Uh, okay, uh, seeing none, I'm uh, gonna go on to the first person signed up, Maggie McCoffey. I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Are you here? All right, we'll go to the next person, Isabella Wise. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Hi, everyone. How's everyone doing? Uh, first, I would like to start by thanking everyone for allowing me to be here today. I do want to, I don't want to read my testimony. I hope that you have it and you were able to read it. I want to speak from the heart today. I am a positive youth development coordinator. I work in Montgomery County with about 100 girls a week in one of my jobs. And one of my most important tasks, I feel that is pregnancy prevention and STI prevention. Uh, the reason why I do this job is because when I was a teenager girl, I did not have any kind of support. Uh, and I got pregnant when I was 15. My school totally, I got pregnant when I was in middle school. So my middle school totally didn't acknowledge my pregnancy. Uh, I went on into high school and uh, I missed school a lot because I used to get sick a lot and my daughter used to get sick. And now that I'm a professional, a professional, I know that I did have postpartum depression, uh, but I didn't know what it was at the moment. So um, my mom was calling to a big meeting and the administrator told her that I should spend more time with my daughter and care for my daughter and drop out of school and take my GED later on in life. So they didn't care. So they, um, you know, nor did I. So they didn't encourage me. So I did drop out of school. And because I dropped out of school, my life became a chaos um, between gang violence and foster care. I did not get my GED until I was 21. Uh, it was really hard for me to go to school and pay out of pocket because I was an undocumented uh, person. I did not, um, I had to pay out of college tuition and it was really expensive. Uh, you know, and like all of that, because I dropped out of school, it brought a lot of traumatizing experiences in my life, which I will live with it forever um, with uh, PTSD and major depression that I will have for the rest of my life. And I feel like it wouldn't only have taken one caring adult to care for me when I was in school and say, hey, everything's going to be OK. Uh, we're going to figure it out. But it wasn't. So, um, you know, I was on my own and uh, my mom wasn't supported and my mom had multiple jobs. So there was no way that she could support me during that time. Um, but now, as a professional, I'm working on my master's and my PhD, but I will say that it took one caring adult, which was my social worker, uh, and when I was in foster care, who helped me a lot. And uh, I do feel like when you're a teen, you're very vulnerable. And for me, getting pregnant at the age of 15 was just traumatizing. I didn't understand what was going on. I know that I have engaged myself in something that I shouldn't have engaged. And, you know, it's just everything went down the hill after that. Um, but, you know, I do support this bill 100% because I feel like we, prevention is cheaper than intervention. So we should have parents have, you know, like childcare in school and um, as I lactated in the bathroom and just threw away the milk on the toilet. So I feel like we should have a designated space for our teenager moms, which is Ms. the reason I support this. Thank you, Ms. Wise. Thank you. Um, uh, next person testifying in the bill, Diana Phillip. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Kaiser and members of the Ways and Means Committee. My name is Diana Phillip. I'm the Executive Director for NARAL Pro Choice Maryland. Our organization is committed to supporting everybody, if, when, and how they form their families, and to 
parent with dignity and good health and safety. We honor pregnancy in all its complexity and we help young people navigate when they decide to become parents. And Title IX federal civil rights law prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex. And that includes pregnant and parenting students. In the last five years, looking at the state vital stats, 2,500 to 3,000 babies are born to school aged teens um, each year in Maryland. And normally only 40% of teen moms finish high school. And we also know that half of the females in the country, in our country who drop out and one third of the males report that becoming a parent was a major factor. This is building, this um, HB, HB 401 is building on the 2017 law that Maryland General Assembly had passed establishing excused absences for legal and medical reasons for pregnant parenting students. Because we recognize that pregnancy is not an illness and that these youth need to be not labeled as truant, including when they need to take their babies for their own health care. We realize that too many of these students feel pressure to drop out of school or are pushed out of school due to discrimination, harassment, or attempts of segregating them from other students, such as being told that they need to go into a GED program or enroll in a different school. In some schools, when she starts showing, the school just shows her the door. Pregnant parenting students often have increased urgency to earn high school diplomas as a mean towards achieving their economic security. These youth, they have the same right to rigorous education as their non-parenting peers. They have a right to realize both their educational and family formation goals. HB 401 calls for policies to be developed by each school district to support pregnant parenting students and the school staff that assist them to connect students to childcare and transportation resources and identify the appropriate spaces for lactation. And I've heard that school staff and faculty would like to have that space as well. The bill also calls for excused time away from class to pump. Now, this bill is not calling for additional staff to be hired, nor building childcare centers or lactation spaces, just helps students seeking assistance be connected to the existing community resources which are appropriate and available. And we hope that these discussions between the students and their schools occur well in advance of when these resources are needed to be secured so that there's little to no interruption in the student's school attendance and class participation. Like accommodations for pregnant and parenting workers seeking, on their, seeking their own on the job site, students wanna be able to participate fully as possible at school, but they need to know what their rights are and that there are supportive people who want them to stay in school and the rights and accommodations available to them should be published in the school handbook, which hopefully is also published online. Lack of child care is the number one reason why a lot of these youth don't come back. Nationally and speaking with school teachers and people personal workers across the state, finding reliable child care, applying for that child care subsidy. The first weeks after giving birth are a struggle as six weeks is the minimum age of infants to be eligible to enter in the regulated child care centers. So there's a risk to infants being placed in ad inadequate or unregulated child care. These students can be challenged in finding the reliable and affordable child care that they need and how to manage the transportation to and from school with the additional- Ms. Phillip, your, your, your time over? is up. Can you, uh, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Summarize um, your, your last sentence. COVID-19 has aspirated all of this because the same youth that were taking care of their babies at home during remote learning, were also taking care of all other babies and children in the household under the lockdown. This is really important that we respond to these youth. Please give us a favorable report on this bill. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, Ms. Phillip. Um, next, I, I do see that Maggie McCaffey is here. McCaughey, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. Yeah, thank you, uh, Maggie McCaughey, and I'm a social worker with over three years of experience working with adolescents in the Maryland public school system. And I strongly support this bill for pregnant and parenting student policies. Uh, these policies would ensure that our parenting students receive supports to achieve their educational outcomes. And we know that this is needed because the state's average teen pregnancy rate is 14.1 per 1,000. And in the community I work in, in South Baltimore, that increases fivefold to 70.9 per 1,000. Um, and unfortunately, the national teen par parent graduation rate um, and the five-year graduation rate in Baltimore City are both similar, around 40%. So our public school system in Maryland is making dropping out of school a very easy decision for over half of our pregnant and parenting students. Um, first of all, childcare is very expensive. So if the students um, can find childcare that's affor affordable and high quality, um, then there's some other, some other factors that come into play. Um, so students have to determine if they can continue with school or if they need to prioritize finding a job and earning money for their family. So most of the 50 plus parenting students that I've encountered um, attempt to do both, but less than half are able to continue with that and end up dropping out of school. And then Along with that, if they 
are able to make the decision to go to school instead of work, getting to school is a whole nother ordeal um, when they're having to take public transportation to drop their student off or their child off at um, child care center or daycare and then get themselves to school. So these are all barriers that in the liaison in the school, in every school would be very, um, would be very helpful in getting over some of those, some of those barriers. Um, and the public school system also can make childcare responsibilities impossible for some teen parents. So medical research tells us that breastfeeding has major health benefits for the infants and their mothers. This is something that anyone who works with new moms is preaching, but I've yet to meet a teen parent who chooses to breastfeed after returning to school because there's simply no safe space to do it, um, to pump and then store the breast milk. So the lactation spaces are really important. Uh, currently, I'm working with a student who's due in February, and the student was just told that she will be expected to continue with virtual school um, with, no, with no time off. So we, this is another important factor we need to make sure that parenting students have an advocate in their school that will uh, make sure the attendance and excuse absence policy passed in 2017 is upheld. Um, so again, I strongly encourage you to support this bill and allow pregnant and parenting teens the support they deserve to achieve their educational goals without sacrificing their health or their financial security for their family. Uh, thank you all for uh, testifying today. We do have uh, one question waiting. Uh -huh. nope. Matters. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. My question is, uh, in Charles County, we've had a, what's called a teenage parenting program for over 20, 20 plus years. And so in looking at the legislation, uh, is a sponsor also considering best practices? For example, some systems that have and acknowledge the continuation of teens uh, in, their, in their schools, as well as acknowledging the work that's done for the, the, the male, the father of these children. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Delegate Patterson. That is a wonderful question. And um, yes, I really appreciate the fact that you want to take policies and programs that are working well in other places and incorporate this into the plan for the future for these, uh, these students. Um, yes, that is actually the idea behind making this, requiring this to be a model policy developed not by each individual county, but by the State Board of Education, by the State Department of Education, because they do have that access to the programs that are working elsewhere. And uh, I can put that together uh, with the, the, some of the other jurisdictions that maybe haven't gotten as far as your county. So yes, they would incorporate that. Um, and actually that suggestion for the, the model policy was made by our chair Kaiser, so I appreciate that actually from her. Um, the uh, was there another part to that question? I'm sorry, Delegate Patterson. Oh, that was it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, if there's no more questions for for this panel, I'm gonna call up um, on the uh, opposition side, uh, Laura Bogley. Bogley, I'm not sure. Uh, welcome to the committee. Yes. Yes, it's it's Bogley, Madam Chair, and thank you so much. Thank you, members of the committee, for your time today. My name is Laura Bogley, and I serve as the Legislative Director for Maryland Right to Life. On behalf of our members in Baltimore County and across the state, we respectfully oppose House Bill 401 as written. We applaud the sponsor's effort to help create an educational environment that supports students in their decisions to parent their children. However, without specific exclusionary language, policy development to improve the educational outcome of pregnant students will likely include taxpayer funding for the increased promotion of and access to abortion. The abortion industry has long been entrenched in Maryland schools and school policy development. In addition to implementing their sexuality curriculum beginning in kindergarten, they also engage in school-based health centers that birth control and abortion referral. So Mima a 16-year-old who was harm her school clinic. Her mother was not made aware uh, of it until her daughter was already gravely ill. Uh, the abortion industry is now attempting to expand their access to school children through the distribution of chemical abortion pills in school clinics and even Planned Parenthood clinics on site in schools as they have done successfully in the state of California. Maryland law recognizes the natural and legal rights of parents to provide consent to their minor child's medical care. 
but the influence of the abortion industry in developing school po policy and curriculum has degraded the role of parents in their children's health care decisions. The lack of parental notification puts pregnant students at greater risk of undiagnosed and untreated abortion complications and enables sexual abusers and sex traffickers. We trust parents to make the best medical decisions for their minor children. Pregnant teens do not need to choose between their education and the life of their child. For these reasons, we respectfully request that you preserve the good intentions and purposes of this bill by amending it to expressly exclude the expansion of the abortion industry into our schools and the formulation of school policy. Thank you for your time and consideration. Uh, Ms. Bogley, I do have to ask, what is it in the bill that you don't like? In combination with the underlying uh, bill, any time that we deal with the uh, issue of pregnant students and uh, improving outcomes of pregnant students, in reality, in application in the school systems, we are talking about including abortion option education and referral. That's the, that's what's going on now in the schools. But we're Is aware of. Bill? May I answer that? May I I'm response? sorry. Is, uh, no, I'm, I, this question from Ms. Bogley. I'm just trying to understand. Is that in this bill? Yes, it is. It is, Delegate. It is in this bill. Uh, Maryland law can, does not discriminate in application. If you have someone that's providing pregnancy services that serves as an umbrella term, which includes the option of terminating pregnancy, you will not find any bills, Delegate, this year introduced that have the term abortion in them. The abortion industry does not advertise that terminology. It refers to pregnancy, um, prenatal care, um, educational outcomes, it will not say abortion, but in application, the law would necessarily need to and not discriminate against the abortion education option and referral part of this process, which is already going on in our public school system. So that, um, so I, I'm just trying to clarify, and maybe Delegate Guyton can answer my question. Uh, what, I, I, what is in the bill about abortion? Thank Del you, Madam uh, Chair. Uh, there is absolutely no language or interpretation of this language, nor intent in this bill that is included or could be construed to be included in this bill, um, other than by you know, actual untruths and, and kind of going off on a conspiracy theory tangent. And, and respectfully, I actually have spoken with Ms. Bogley on the phone about this bill, and we've discussed it quite a bit, and I've ensured her as well that uh, this is not a pro-abortion bill. I'm, I'm honestly confounded that a group that calls itself Right to Life is going to oppose a bill that's going to allow uh, young ladies and, and young gentlemen to actually become parents rather than to make the difficult choice to end pregnancy. So to me, that is very confusing, but I absolutely guarantee this community, committee that okay. there's no language in this bill. Okay, I was just trying to clarify. Through the school. I was just trying to clarify the language part. Uh, I think you were both going beyond the question, just yes. clarifying that there's no particular language in the bill. Um, if, if there, are there any other questions for Ms. Bogley? Uh, thank you, Ms. Bogley. Um, Katie Glenn, I think is here. Uh, informational, didn't sign up uh, for or oppose. I don't know. Are you, are you in the room? Ms. Katie Glenn? Uh, not seeing Ms. Glenn, uh, we're done with the hearing on House Bill 401. Thank you all very much uh, for testifying. Uh, the next bill, Delegate Guyton, is um, House Bill 359. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. And I apologize, I'm going to take a deep breath. This one will be very short. This is a companion bill to House Bill and after we've had the wonderful policy put into place that allows students to um, find a healthy and safe place to pump at school, helps them achieve um, issue, uh, deal with issues with transportation and childcare, and excuses their absences from class for, uh, for lactation, then we want to actually be able to determine how well those policies are working and whether in fact they are improving the outcomes of our students. And that is what House Bill 359 does. This adds, a, a, it's a companion bill that adds a de-identified mark, data marker for pregnant and parenting use to the Maryland Longitudinal Data System in accordance with all of the predetermined privacy st standards that, uh, that surround that system. And I urge this committee to give a favorable report to HB 359 um, and 401 to help us use real data to inform policy decisions and analyze the long-term successes 
and the challenges of parenting students in their academics and in their job market through the Maryland Longitudinal Data System. I do wanna point out that neither of these two bills come with any fiscal note. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Delegate Guyton. Any questions for Delegate Guyton? Delegate Hornberger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my other role that I play, uh, facility build out, we actually constructed some of these lactation rooms inside of our buildings uh, that were accessed by both patrons, customers, and then staff. The, the inclusion of a lactation room at the schools, there, there's currently not lactation rooms for the staff. Is that correct? Um, no, and actually, it, I'm sorry, is this, am I on mute? I'm no, sorry. Is this, the, is this a question on House Bill 3? for House Bill. Longitudinal data system? Well, no, I, I just wanted to, to two, the two bills that you're presenting are tied together, right? One is the Fair. Yeah, it, it's an easy the, answer. <laughs> sorry, an easy sorry answer. I apologize. Yep, no worries. Uh, no, the answer is uh, I'm not sure if that's the case in all schools, but we are not okay. asking that a special lactation room be developed. We're just asking that a private place be provided. So that's okay. very different than than actually yep. constructing a lactation space. Okay, yeah, that was Thank the clarification you. that I wanted. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Sorry, Delegate Hornberger. Thank you. Great question. Um, yep. Anybody else? Question for Delegate Guyton. Um, if not, we have one person signed up, Brittany Ellers. Hi, uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and delegates of this committee. Uh, thank you so much for letting me uh, speak and provide more background information on this bill. Um, so I'm Brittany Ehlers. I'm a policy and research intern with NARAL Pro-Choice Maryland, and I'm also a graduate student at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, and my main intent um, is to provide you all with a little more background information on why this data dissemination and collection uh, part of the bill is so important. Um, and to kind of give you a sense of where Maryland is at with um, their statistics and, and where they are at with providing support for pregnant and parenting youth. Um, so this uh, bill is going to provide an indicator as previously mentioned. Um, during the 2017-2018 school year, uh, there were 2,645 children born to women under the age of 19 in the state. And we know this um, from vital statistics reports. Um, where we do see a gap, however, is in the reporting of um, the reasons in which students decide to drop out of school. Um, and so during that same academic year, um, the Maryland State Department of Education reported that only 49 students um, reported their reason for dropping out of school uh, was because of parenting or pregnancy related reasons. And that was out of approximately 9,000 students who had dropped out. And of those 9,000 students who had dropped out, I just wanna note that 5,000 uh, had a categorization as whereabouts unknown, meaning that we don't know why they decided to drop out of school. Um, and kind of uh, expanding upon this, I just wanted every, um, everyone to be made aware that Maryland is not the first state to collect information on this. However, they will be the first state to establish a formal indicator in their state longitudinal database system. Uh, the other state that has um, reported on pregnant and parenting status, status is Wisconsin. And they did this through a grant with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in a few school districts um, in the state. And their main intent was to uh, repeat pregnancy, uh, repeat pregnancies and health outcomes, and then also track educational status of these students. Um, and as previously mentioned, um, this will be de-identified aggregated data. So students will be given, be given an identifier. And based off um, the study in Wisconsin, they relied mostly on self-reported data from the students. And so we will be looking to do the same as well with this bill to respect the privacy um, and ethics associated with um, right to privacy for these students. Um, and that is all. We hope you will support this bill. Um, and thank you so much for your time today. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Any questions for Ms. Ellers? Uh, thank you. Uh, seeing no questions, we're done with the hearing on House Bill 359. We have uh, just one bill left. Delegate Guyton, bring it home. <laughs> with a hat trick. All right, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Switching to a different 
topic, members of Ways and Means. Again, Delegate Michelle Guyton, District 42B. And now I'm here to ask you for your consideration of uh, your reconsideration of House Bill 392, which is a reintroduction of last year's House Bill 396, which passed this committee and the House unanimously last session. This legislation is presented to you in its final form, which includes amendments added by the Early Childhood Subcommittee last year. The bill requires that all child care centers licensed by Maryland State Department of Education Office of Child Care offer screening either on site or by referral, that is a change from, from last year's bill, to appropriate programs to all families of children under three years of age. The purpose of this legislation is to ensure that children with developmental delays are identified and that they receive appropriate interventions as early as possible in order to achieve the best outcomes and to ensure that they are kindergarten ready. So I have spoken with subcommittee chair Ebersol about this bill and I am happy to continue to work with him and the subcommittee to make a few wording change, changes that have been suggested uh, to satisfy the concerns of child care advocates who have reached out to me during the interim. So uh, with that, I ask for a favorable report on House Bill 396. Thank you very much. Thank you, Delegate. Any questions for Delegate Guyton? All right, uh, last person to testify today, we have Mr. George Tolley uh, in favor of the bill. Uh, yes, Your Honor, or I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, yes, Madam Chair and uh, members of the committee, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, we were not uh, uh, part of the, the group that testified with respect to this bill last year, and there's a very good reason why we're here this time. Uh, we're supportive of the bill uh, with an amendment, and we're here uh, favorable with amendments. An amendment last year that was put on the bill in the course of the discussions, and it appears in the bill at page three, lines two through five, adds an immunity for individual employees who offer an, uh, an early childhood evaluation. Uh, what, it, what it says is, except for willful or grossly negligent act, an employee who offers an evaluation under this section in good faith to a child in accordance with the department's guidelines is immune from civil liability. And, and the question we ask is immunity from civil liability for what? What conceivable liability is there? Um, the, the, the opposition to immunities we have is, it is, especially immunities that don't make sense is there is a risk that the courts will look at that and say that an em employee who offers an evaluation gets immunity that is broad enough to cover anything that might actually result in immunity, like child abuse or something like that, that, that basically the legislature is with this language granting immunity for things that you're really not intending to grant immunity for because it doesn't make any sense to grant immunity because you offered a department sponsored evaluation of a child and all you did was offer it. Um, the offering the the evaluation doesn't generate liability. I apologize for that. Doesn't generate liability. So the immunity, because it makes no sense, is a, a potential mischief. If there is a child care center that behaves poorly or provides unreasonably unsafe care, and they can say, well, but we, we offer these evaluations and that gives us immunity according to the legislature. We don't see any harm in striking out lines two through five on page three. Uh, it, 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 I don't know why, it's, why they're there. I'm not sure what, what request there was. I wasn't part of the discussions last year and I'd be happy to defer to, to, to Delegate Guyton on that and work with her to, to try to get a, a, an amendment written up so that uh, it can be adopted and then uh, the bill goes forward. But that, that's really the only reason I'm here is those four lines. But thank you very much for the time and I'm happy to answer any question. Madam Chair, I, I can address that if you, if that's- Well, I think my new name is Your Honor, Delegate Ebersol. So. Your Honor, <laughs> yes. Z Delegate Lukey was suggesting that by text, so I- <laughs> Yeah, well, there's another-, I'm just, there's another I'm just kidding, of course, please, uh, Delegate Ebersol. If, 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 the, uh, De if Delegate Guyton doesn't mind, um, I think uh, you are correct. I think uh, as public school teachers, we know that we have to be incredibly careful about what we recommend to parents. Um, especially if we're not professionals in those areas. Um, and so I think this was designed 
to protect them from a parent becoming incensed or angry that we had that someone had suggested and would suggest that we have screenings and and offer and offer screening. Um, you you may be right, and we'll, and I think it's worth us looking at that we should make the language maybe more specific to that that they not be held uh, civilly responsible for making the recommendation. Mr. I'm sorry. As I said, I'm, I'm, I appreciate you're taking the, the request uh, under advisement and I make myself available uh, through our, our group and you can reach us through the Compass Government Relations, uh, our lobbying uh, arm, or the, the folks who do our lobbying for us. Um, we'll be happy to try to work with you to get language that, that solves that problem. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, thank you, Mr. Tolley. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you for uh, Delegate Guyton for, for closing out our day. Uh, we're done at this point with our hearing. I wanted to give a chance to any, excuse me, any subcommittee chairs if they had any announcements. Uh, starting with the, I don't see the vice chair, uh, Delegate Lukey. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I, uh, I just wanted to let members of the Revenue Subcommittee know that we will not be meeting this week. We will likely meet next week uh, on Wednesday or Thursday. All right, Delegate Patterson. Thank you, Madam Chair. The same is with the gaming and, and race, racing. Um, we will meet next week. Thank you. Uh, Delegate Ebersole. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, Early Childhood will meet tomorrow at 1230 to take up two bills that were heard today. Uh, being that there's so few bills, it's very unlikely that the full committee will vote at the end of this week. Uh, I would like to, uh, to uh, point out that um, Delegate Lukey apparently uh, ran a poll of what our timer should be named. Uh, and, I, and I went with that today and I made the change and it's timing McTimer face. I then try to put um, the pronouns after it, but there wasn't enough room for the pronouns. On the screen, so I thought that might be uh, interesting as well. Anyway, I suggested to Delegate Lutke that um, we, we could, as long as there's no uh, um, offensive jokes or a sexual nature that we certainly change the name every time. And why did I not first ask them to turn off the recording? <laughs> 